This happened in 2019. I was in my second year at college. At the time, I lived with two other girls in a town home, but they were back at their parents' house for the holidays. I work in healthcare and would be working Christmas that year. A bit of backstory. There used to be four of us living there, but one of our roommates had to move out due to issues with her boyfriend. He suffered from a condition called jackass. He was supposed to come every so often, but basically ended up living there. We told her that she had to kick him out after an incident where he got physical with her and verbally abusive with the rest of us. She wouldn't listen, and we told her that she would have to talk to the landlord. Long story short, she ended up moving out and left on bad terms with us. On another side note, I've also been in an abusive relationship, so I understand how things might have been for her. I tried my best for two years at that point to help her open her eyes and get her away from him, but you know how it goes. The entire situation was affecting everyone that lived there, and we didn't feel safe with him around, so she had to move out. It was Christmas Eve, and I had to work the next day. So I was getting ready for bed. I locked the doors, turned off all the lights, and went downstairs to the basement where my bedroom was. I was scrolling on my phone for about an hour. It was Christmas Day at this point. That's when I heard what sounded like chairs in the kitchen being moved. The kitchen is right above my bedroom. I thought maybe I was hearing the neighbors next door as we share the same walls, and sometimes they can be loud. But I remember one of them texting me and asking me to bring in a package they were expecting since they were gone. The noise was brief, so I just brushed it off. The next thing I knew, my bedroom door is being creaked open. In this moment, I get a flashback and remembered my second grade teacher telling us about the time someone had broken into her house and she acted as if she was sleeping. So if they were just there to rob her, they wouldn't feel the need to hurt her. But my phone screen was lighting up my scared, jaw-dropped face, so I was unable to put on that facade. My bed faces directly to the door, so we're just looking right at each other. I was shitting myself while the intruder had one foot in my bedroom, with the door cracked open. It felt like an eternity, but in reality it was probably only about 10 seconds. We were just staring at each other. He slowly closes my door. I just sit there in complete and utter shock. I could not make out what he looked like, as my eyes were still adjusting to the dark. All I could see was a backward baseball cap. I knew that I had to call the police, but my anxious ass knew that if I called, it would alert my parents. It was part of our phone plan. Me being dumb as hell, didn't want to worry them. I was also scared that he might still be in the house, and I didn't know what he would do if he heard me call. So I texted my boyfriend. Some random guy just broke into my house and came into my room. He immediately snapped me out of it and texted back. Call the police. The dispatcher asked me if I felt comfortable to go unlock the front door for them, so they wouldn't have to break it down. I told her no way. I don't care if the door is broken. I'm not going up there alone. A couple minutes later I see flashlights shining through my window. I hear the police knocking at the door and announcing themselves. Once they were inside, they asked me where I was. I came out of my room, and they escorted me outside. They told me to wait on the back porch while they searched the house. It was like a scene straight out of a horror movie. They didn't find anyone, and said that it looked like nothing had been taken, and that there were no signs of forced entry. My boyfriend came and stayed with me for the rest of that night, but I still couldn't sleep. I kept getting up to check every inch of the house. I placed chairs under the door handles on the front door, back door, and even my bedroom. The next day I informed our landlord what happened, but she refused to come out and change the locks, even when winter break was over. For the rest of the time we stayed there, 
The locks were never changed. I believe it was our old roommate's boyfriend. I think he had an extra key made for him at some point, because he was basically living there. But I don't understand why he didn't do anything to me, and he didn't take anything. If I'm wrong and it was somebody random, I don't know why they wouldn't have done what they intended. What were their intentions? Well, that could have been any number of things. So I live in a dorm on campus at my college. I was back a week early during winter break for Greek recruitment, basically interviewing with and visiting different sororities. And the only people on campus were a few other students doing the same and a skeleton crew. They didn't have the cleaning company, dining hall staff, or even our resident assistants around. There were four dorm towers, 12 floors each. I was the only one on my floor and one of only a few in the entire tower. To get up to the dorm this week, you had to check in with the front desk to get your key activated. If you didn't have a key coded to a specific tower or room, you wouldn't even be able to access the elevator. Now, I was in my room on the second night of the week. I had settled back in and sitting on my futon, back against one of the armrests and facing the door. The rooms were your typical long rectangles, with a window on one end and a door on the other. My bed was lofted above me and a blanket was hanging down. So you essentially couldn't see me from the doorway. I was lying there with my headphones in, scrolling through YouTube videos. When I heard the door opening, not only was there a distinct sound of the key card going in, like a hotel room door, I also have Christmas ornaments hanging from the ceiling. I knew that the door had opened all the way because it had hit an ornament, causing it to fall off its hook. I froze in fear. I knew my roommate wasn't back and neither was my RA. And those are the only two people that would have access to my room. My first thought was that whoever this was would realize their mistake and quickly back out kind of like opening an occupied bathroom stall. But as I sat there, barely breathing, I heard them taking two steps forward and even bumping into my suitcase, which was taking up most of the doorway. I adjusted slightly, moving to reach my phone, causing my futon to squeak. Instantly, the footsteps retreated and the door closed. I was stuck where I was for maybe an hour, until I could finally muster up the courage to get up. There on the ground was the broken ornament and my suitcase sitting slightly ajar. I texted my roommate and my RA, practically begging them to tell me that they were back, but my roommate was still in London and my RA confirmed my worst fears, but she also had no idea who would be able to get into my room. Even if the cleaning people or maintenance guys were back, they didn't have permission to go into the dorms, nor any way to get in. She assured me she would let the front desk know, and also suggested it was probably a spring admission student who had gotten the wrong key. I accepted that as an answer. They were confused, heard the futon, and realized they had got the wrong room. It would never happen again if that was it. But I still struggled to sleep that night. I even felt terrified to turn around and look at the door when I woke up the next morning. Night returned, unable to sleep and still very scared. I was once again up late browsing Reddit. This time I had my phone close to me and had taped a piece of string over the door since I no longer had my ornament alarm. I needed to validate that I wasn't going crazy. Once again at 3 a.m. I heard heavy footsteps outside my door. the distinct use of a key card, and my door opening up. I stayed perfectly still, and I realized I could see a reflection of a silhouette in the microwave's door, which sat against the window facing the doorway. They stood there and nearly filled up the entire doorway, the light from the hallway streaming around them into my dark room. I once again found myself frozen. Convinced whoever this person was had ill intent. 
last night wasn't a mistake. I hit play on a video I had queued up, and as soon as the ad started playing, the figure left and the door closed behind them, and the footsteps retreated. I told my RA and my roommate about this, as well as the front desk, the next morning. All of them confirmed that no one else had a registered key for my floor in my tower, whether it was another student or employees. I didn't sleep for the rest of that week and kept my suitcase and chair in front of the door, but it never happened again. But even now, months later, that 9x20 room is terrifying to me whenever I'm there alone at night, since whoever comes through that door is only a few steps away from my bed and blocks the only way out. This happened 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve, and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I would be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so, and I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest. There are parts of it that are completely unlit, but nothing to fear. I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. Both of us were just driving and talking away. There's a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road is a thick forest. The only thing that we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drove down the hill, crossed the bridge, then back uphill through more forest. It was when the highway begins to flatten out again that it happened. Something sprints across the road. So quickly, I nearly hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turn to my girlfriend. Hey, did you just see that? She confirmed that she had, but couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote. They're a fairly common sight around this area but something fell off about this entire situation. Whatever it was ran out in front of the car, then disappeared into the woods. Coyotes usually don't dart out in front of cars like that. So, for some reason, I decided to check it out. I turned the car around and switch on the high beams to illuminate the forest. I then step out of the car and began walking towards the woods. I don't see anything, but as I drew closer to the tree line, it feels like perhaps I had made a grave mistake. My heart was pounding, and the hairs on the back of my neck were now standing at full attention. I don't see anything unusual in the trees. Then suddenly, the car horn blasts. I hurry back to the car and ask my girlfriend what was going on. She didn't say anything. Instead, she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I look over in that direction, and that's when I saw it. Without a doubt, this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It appeared to be a man, completely naked. His skin was covered in mud and in one of his hands, he was holding a hatchet. He looked back at us, and then he smiled, then waved, just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there. Once we were safely on the road again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was trying to look for the man in the direction that he initially vanished in, he circled around and came out from another spot in the forest 
beyond the car's headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she spotted him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking toward me, his hatchet raised as if making to strike me. We called the authorities once we safely got back home, but they never found anybody. The officer we spoke to explained his theory. The man was looking to ambush unsuspecting travelers. We all agreed that my girlfriend's quick thinking saved my life that night, as it let my potential murderer know that I wasn't alone out there. I moved back into that area recently, so now I drive on that highway often. There hasn't been any naked hatchet man sightings yet, but I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now, especially whenever I'm near Deep Creek. I used to deliver on a paper route when I was 13. It was that sort of old school route where I'd hustle every morning around 6 a.m. with a satchel, dropping off the daily paper to houses. It was a pretty cool gig, simple and pretty much exactly what you'd expect. The one lame part about the job was that it was rain or shine. No matter the weather, even if it was pitch black with a blizzard, the paper was getting delivered. That's probably why they used to hire kids back in the day. It was easier to pressure them to go, and they had to walk that route either way. One day, I was dropping off papers as usual in the morning. It was winter and still dark. These were my favorite shifts because it felt like the whole world hadn't quite turned on yet. It was cool seeing all the homes nice and cozy, maybe a wisp or two of smoke still escaping the chimneys. It's just nostalgic for no reason, maybe because of the holidays. I slogged on through the dark. The few street lights that guided my route cast dim yellow glares into the snow drifts beneath them. I remember it being extra still and ominous. I would periodically stop between houses to catch my breath, but it was really to survey the neighborhood. I still can't put my finger on it, even to this day but I remember just feeling weird that morning. Something was off, but not anything I was aware of. All I could do was push on through the cold and get the job done. Shortly after passing a house at the end of a cul-de-sac, I heard two loud pops, followed by a third a minute later. I grew up around guns and knew that sound, but I just carried on with my route. I figured it was someone getting their car started and the exhaust backfired or something. I'd seen that happen to my dad's truck before, and other cars around town, so I knew it was a possibility. In my 13-year-old brain, it was way more likely than three consecutive gunshots. I waited to say anything to anyone until later on that morning. It's just one of those things you don't want to mention because you don't know the gravity of the situation. When I mentioned what I'd heard, my parents immediately told me that it was all in my head. It probably was just a car backfiring. It did put me at ease, and I just went on with my day. That confirmed what I was so desperate to believe. Later that morning, my neighborhood was full of police and news vans, centered around the house. They were clamoring for neighbors or anyone who'd been around the cul-de-sac that morning. My parents told me to stay inside, but the truth is that I would have never gone to speak to them. Just like when I hesitated to tell my parents, I felt like I was doing something awful when I told them about what I heard. It felt disrespectful, strange, and very ominous felt wrong. I didn't know every single neighbor that we had at the time, but if any of them were dead, I wouldn't have the stomach to hear the news. That was a heavy realization too, that the paper boy knew first. Maybe that is why I hesitated. I would be speaking about people I didn't know at all, and it felt very sad to me. You may be able to tell the story gave me a lifetime of very quiet, suffocating PTSD. We got the full story as it was pieced together throughout the week. The man who lived in the house was older, at least older than my dad, and had been a local for a very long time. He had a son who was in the army and had been away for some time. He went through a deployment of some kind. I don't know the exact military details, but he eventually came home to visit his father. When he arrived back at home, he wasn't alone. He brought another guy with him and then proceeded to come out to his father as gay. The other guy was his boyfriend. No one really knew any of the details beyond that, other than how the visit concluded. The dad shot and killed them both that morning, then immediately turned the gun on himself. This is all speculation, but I imagine it was a cold visit for them, 
even colder with a half foot of snow, burying the house and clogging up the streets. It was probably the morning they were planning on heading back to the base or wherever they lived. The father just couldn't take it. Couldn't leave them like that. It's a tragedy and impacted the entire community, but no one more than me. I didn't deliver another paper for a while. Everyone was pretty understanding as to why. Even the newspaper editor. The talk of the town, but for me, it was a memory. It's like I was the fourth man in the room when it happened or something. Be good to yourselves out there. I was driving to work during the tail end of a massive snowstorm. Or sort of essential, food service. But for a college campus. Many of the students who live on campus don't have kitchen in their dorms or... Many don't even drive, so lots of them wouldn't eat if we didn't open up. This made us travel up through some pretty insane conditions, but those kids wouldn't eat if we didn't show up. Even restaurants near campus closed during a level 3 snow emergency inside the city. Anyway, the informal policy for work for these situations is just to make an honest effort if you can, but don't risk your life. I'm one of the few there that has a four-wheel drive. And I have the biggest vehicle, a crew cab truck. So I drive down to campus and then pick up workers who live nearby that wanted to come in. I'm rolling down the highway at a decent clip, only one lane that had been sort of plowed. I'd scoot over to the far left and kicked it into four wheel. Not many cars out. It's still snowing and things are going pretty smooth and I'm feeling good. Never fall for that overconfidence though. That's what brings on the trouble. Once you're confident, get relaxed and after that it's all over you stop making decisions and start reacting that's when you forfeit control i'm doing about 40 miles per hour when i notice a pair of headlights coming up behind me faster than they should it has to be an emergency vehicle right i i couldn't really tell i signal to move over to the middle lane just in case they're starting to ease over the headlights are getting closer way faster than i'm comfortable with it's close enough now that I can tell it's a big, lifted SUV. Now my farm truck is pretty big, but I'm not keen on wrecking it, and I certainly don't want to tangle with something that's that big in this weather. I assume it has four-wheel drive as well, but what a jackass. There's no reason to be driving this fast on ice and snow. I let off the pedal and start inching to the far right lane, just about the time he's going to overtake me, just as we're heading onto a bridge. Something went wrong for the guy. That ice got him and he started fishtailing. I'm ever so gingerly towing the brake, trying to slow the best I can without risking the same fate for myself. I know without a doubt in my mind, this driver is a lost cause, maybe even a fatality. I'm trying to create as much distance as possible when he collides with something, crashes in the snow, I have a nasty habit of pulling the cars around them into the mix as well. There's just too many extra factors with all the sliding and the embankments. The SUV loses all traction, spins, and goes sliding over across my lane, missing me by inches. Windshield facing windshield. It was close enough that we locked eyes for a split second, and I could see the terror in them. Then he spun away from me, into the darkness and off the road. He was exactly what I expected. Young, either arrogant or ignorant, to how to drive in the snow. Maybe there was an emergency somewhere, but who knows. We both just crossed the bridge as this happened. He went flying off the highway right where the guardrail ended, sailing into some trees. I saw the branches shake and the snow fall with a whoosh, then nothing but the faint glow of the taillights. Now I had to call this idiot in, and I can't tell you how common it is for some dummy driver to send their car sailing off a roadway, snow or shine, only to never be found. Calling it in is the move, because the person that just crashed might be unconscious and there's no way to get to them. They could wake up later with no memory of where they were and even if they do remember, sometimes the crash can rearrange the contents of a car. Their phone might not be where they left it. Either way, that dumbass not only wrecked driving like an idiot, but almost came inches from taking me with him. I saw a couple of cars behind me slowing down and pulling off, so I called 911 and kept right on to work. My butt cheeks were clenched so tight, I thought I was going to have to get someone to pry me off the truck seat with a crowbar. It's not always the ice and snow that'll get you into trouble. It's the damn idiots you share the roads with, who don't know how to drive safe in it at all. I'm so glad that I don't live in apartments anymore. 
at least in the city I used to live in. I had a family across the hall from me, and they were okay people, except for their oldest son. He didn't say much, but when he did, he talked in a creepy kind of soft-spoken way like Michael Jackson, but more like he was on something. He had offered to help us move my wife's stuff into our apartment when her family showed up with a U-Haul, and her family being trusted people said yes. Now, I was a bit hesitant, but we did need the extra help. We somehow got to talking about a pair of pants that I no longer needed, and he's immediately like, Yo, can I have them? Sure, whatever, dude. He stares at the pants like he found a lost treasure. It was weird. As we're moving stuff, he then asks if there's anything else he can have. Creepy. I told him we'd let him know if something fit him that we don't want. After that, my wife knew firsthand just how weird he was. One time, he randomly knocked on our door and asked if we wanted to buy some candy. Fast forward a few months later, and some unrelated stuff in our apartment was making us uneasy, and we were seriously considering not renewing our lease. I knew it was time to leave when we were woken up at 6 a.m. one morning to hear the police shouting, It's the police! Open up! We have a search warrant! They shout two more times, and then we hear a loud crack, and we saw through the people that they busted down a door. A week later, the family moved out. I hated that they left because other members of the family seemed pretty normal. Unfortunately, a week or two later, we see the older creepy ass son hanging around our hallway. I had nodded to him on my way out to get the mail, and I then called my wife like, He's still here? What the hell? She says I should strike up a conversation to find out if his family's still here, and then I'm confused even though we saw them taking out furniture. So when I came back to the apartment, I had made eye contact and I asked how his family's doing. They're good. He responds. Cool, cool. Good to hear. I haven't seen y'all around lately. I thought I saw them moving stuff out. Wait, did y'all move? Yeah, they moved. I ended the conversation soon after and then went back into my own apartment. If they moved, why the hell is he hanging around our hallway? The only thing I can think of is that maybe the older son was into drugs, which would explain his weird behavior. Then the police caught him buying or selling drugs and busted down his family's place because it's his address. Maybe they didn't take him with them because they didn't want part of any of his lifestyle. It's really the only thing I can make out of it, and we only saw him a couple more times before we moved. We barely landed an opening in an apartment on the other side of the town, which is much safer. Our budget was real tight, but it was well worth it, and I'm so glad that I don't live in that area anymore. Peace, love, and be safe and vigilant out there, everyone. Please. Maureen Anu Kelly was born on September 26th of 1993 and was raised by a single mother named Mapuana in Spokane, Washington. Following her graduation from Lewis and Clark High School, she listed her occupation on Facebook as guru, at spreading the love, but told friends she aspired to become a singer-songwriter. Owing to her heritage as a Pacific Islander, Marine's instrument of choice was the ukulele, and she often posted videos of intimate bedroom performances on the video streaming site YouTube. Maureen's half-sister, Cherry Kapu, later described her as a very laid-back, carefree girl, and mentioned how in June of 2013, 19-year-old Maureen had called her to request a favor. She called me before she left, saying she was going camping with friends and asked if she could borrow some of my camping gear, Sherry said. She was excited about going and told me she loved me, and that was totally normal for her. She was a very affectionate person. The next day, Maureen stopped by Sherry's apartment to collect the camping gear. When Sherry asked where she was headed, Maureen replied that she and her friends planned to visit the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. The reply surprised Sherry. Maureen was very much an admirer of Mother Nature, but she was not an experienced camper. She had previously expressed a desire to spend a prolonged period living outdoors, but had never been suited to the realities of wilderness living. I asked her why now, 
Sherry later said, and Noreen told me that she wanted to go on a spiritual quest, and that really concerned me. As she departed, Sherry waved Maureen off after wishing her the very best of luck, but little did she know, it was the last time they'd ever see each other. Located around three hours' drive southeast of Seattle, the Gifford Pinchot National Forest extends more than 70 miles along the western slopes of the Cascade Mountain Range, from Mount Rainier in the west to the Columbia River in the east. The forest consists of broad, old-growth woodland and high mountain meadows, along with several glaciers and numerous volcanic peaks. The forest also features the Canyon Creek Campground, a small, lightly used camp tucked in the forest adjacent to the eponymous body of water. Eight campsites are available for tent camping only and come complete with a small dining table and a fire ring for warmth and cooking. To get there, Maureen and her friends drove out to Chalachi near Highway 503 on June 9th of 2013. From there, they traveled east on Road 54 then turned down a series of small back roads until they reached Canyon Creek. They found the campsite, along with the trail that led to it, completely unmaintained but Marine's companions were experienced campers and set about making the area much more comfortable for themselves. The group set about clearing away all the fallen pine needles from the camp stove and table, then, after setting up their tents for the evening, they enjoyed a small campfire dinner. Yet following their meal, the group noticed that Marine's behavior took a turn for the bazaar. Her fellow campers were well aware of her desire to embark on some kind of spiritual journey, but had no idea what that entailed. So when Maureen approached her tent and began to strip completely naked, her companions were nothing short of flabbergasted. By the time she was ready to begin her spiritual journey, Maureen was barefoot and wearing nothing but a small fanny pack containing a knife, some matches, and a compass. Her friends advised her against heading out into the woods in such a state of undress, but the 19-year-old insisted. She reassured her companions that she wouldn't walk too far, and would be back by midnight at the very least, as well as insisting that her state of undress was essential to the completion of the aforementioned journey. And so, with trepidation, Maureen's friends watched her disappear among the trees, and never to be seen again. When midnight came and went, and Maureen failed to reappear, her friends began to panic. They fanned out into the darkness of the woods, flashlights in hand, and called out to their missing companion, but there was no reply to be heard. Unable to rest while Maureen remained unaccounted for, her friends contacted the local sheriff's department to report her missing. Around an hour later, the first deputies arrived at the campground to begin their investigation. Skamania County Undersheriff Dave Cox later recalled this interaction with unease. Maureen's friends told us that she talked about doing this spiritual quest thing for quite some time, he said. Apparently, she felt it was something she needed to do. Cox said his deputies told the teenagers to be brutally honest with them, before asking if Maureen had been under the influence of drugs or alcohol at the time of her disappearance. Each vehemently denied any kind of drug or alcohol use, and according to Dave Cox, their position seemed more than plausible. They could have quite easily tidied up the campsite prior to the deputy's appearance, but upon their arrival, the teenagers seemed alert and focused, with deputies observing no evidence of drug or alcohol consumption at the campsite. Within just a few short hours, under Sheriff Cox was helping orchestrate one of the largest search and rescue efforts Skamania County had ever seen, but right away, the prognosis was grim. The area that Maureen had ventured into, almost completely nude, with nightfall rapidly approaching, is one of the steepest and most hazardous in the entire region. Sharon Ward, a representative of the Pacific Crest Search Dogs Association, personally participated in the search and rescue effort. The area Maureen walked off into is amazingly steep. It's called Canyon Creek for a reason, Sharon said. How she got down there is a mystery, but then climbing up again in her bare feet, that had to be tough going. It's a remote area, lots of timber and brush, so her feet would have been cut up by the time she made it up to the other side, 
and she did make it up there, we're in no doubt of that. A total of 75 professional and volunteer rescue workers combed the woods around Canyon Creek for five whole days. They did so in shifts, employing a multitude of search and rescue techniques over an area of four square miles. But by far the most effective asset at the disposal was the team of dedicated tracker dogs. After honing in on marine scent, the dogs traversed the entirety of Canyon Creek, then headed north into the woods towards a pathway known as Forest Road No. 54. Expert trackers followed close behind and quickly detected a series of human footprints in the soft dirt. Investigators were in no doubt that these belonged to Marine, but after following them north towards the service road, the footprints suddenly and inexplicably disappeared. Investigators then looked to the tracker dogs to continue marking out the trail, but they simply wandered among the trees for a while before returning to follow the scent trail in reverse. For those present, they must have made for an extremely chilling moment. For all intent and purpose, they were standing in the place where Maureen Kelly had simply ceased to exist. It was a truly baffling turn of events, but the search teams followed standard operating procedure and spent the next four days using Maureen's last known location as the focal point for their operation. Rescue workers combed the area around road number 54, carefully searching for any new tracks or scent trails, but as the days went by, the weather grew worse and worse. Thick cloud cover prevented helicopter teams from circling the area, while heavy rain impeded the ground team's ability to conduct a proper search. A person could literally walk right on top of somebody and never know it, one volunteer later said. Then, if they were rolled over a log or something, forget about it. We'd have to dig up the whole forest to find them. By June 15th, just less than a week after she'd initially disappeared, Maureen's loved ones began to consider the possibility that the search teams were no longer looking for a live person. Despite the weather on the day of her disappearance being relatively mild, nighttime temperatures would have quite possibly dipped into the 40s, then, coupled with some light rain, Maureen could have found herself developing hypothermia at an alarming and unexpected rate. This theory became increasingly popular following the rescue effort's conclusion, which came at 6 p.m. on June 15, 2013. Skamania County Sheriff personally promised Maureen's mother that the investigation would continue and that no matter how tragic her daughter's end, her remains would be brought home. Professionals and volunteers alike continued the search area surrounding Service Road 54, albeit on a much slower and ad hoc basis. But as the months went by, something very chilling became evident. Given that the prevailing theory was that Maureen had fallen victim to the elements, it stood reason that it was only a matter of time before her body, or what remained of it, was recovered. Yet time after time, both professional and amateur search teams headed out into the woods and came back empty-handed. Some posited that Maureen's remains had been set upon by hungry scavengers and that they could now be spread out over a much wider area. But if that were the case, surely one of the many search and rescue teams would have reported such a discovery. Not even an animal bone was isolated and analyzed as possibly belonging to Maureen which leads us to believe that her fate may well have been very different from those suggested by search and rescue experts. Last June marked the 10-year anniversary of Marine's mysterious disappearance, and as frustrating as it is, an entire decade has brought us no closer to understanding what truly happened to her. Yet perhaps the best insight into her ultimate fate can be found in a Facebook status that she posted on June 6th of 2013, just three days before she wandered off into the woods with not a stitch of clothing on her. Happiness, she wrote, is something that cannot be found. Born on September 2, 1965, Andy Puglisi grew up in the small city of Lawrence, Massachusetts. By the time he was 10 years old, Andy resided with his mother and stepfather at the Stadium Housing Projects in South Lawrence, 
named so because it lies in the shadow of the city's Veterans Memorial Stadium. Residents remember the housing project as a fine place to grow up, a short walk from the Sean Sheen Ballpark and Stadium Plaza Shopping Center. There was plenty for little Andy to occupy himself with when he wasn't at school, but perhaps his favorite place to hang out was the public swimming pool just across the street from his apartment building. Around noon on August 22nd, 1976, Andy was paddling around the pool with a friend named Melanie Perkins. Then, just after 2 p.m., Melanie began to feel hungry. She told Andy that she would be heading home to get some lunch, but despite her family's apartment being less than 200 yards away, she professed a fear of walking home. In the end, Melanie convinced her older brother to walk her home, and she did not return to the pool that day. Around 5.45 p.m., around 15 minutes before Andy was due home for dinner, the pool's lifeguard spotted him wandering around the water's edge. However, when 6 p.m. came and went and Andy hadn't returned home for dinner, his parents went looking for him. They arrived at the pool just minutes later, but little Andy was nowhere to be found. They rushed to contact the police, but initial theories placed Andy as a runaway. Being a child of divorce, the police considered the possibility that he had run off to find his father. However, when they contacted the man, he had no knowledge of his son's location. The next day, a team of police officers, civilian volunteers, National Guardsmen, and off-duty Special Forces soldiers scoured the surrounding neighborhood equipped with sniffer dogs and portable CB radios. The search was then expanded to the city dump, while specially trained divers dredged the bottom of the nearby Shashin River. But perhaps the area of the most interest to search teams was the wooded area adjacent to the public swimming pool. Some theorized that the woods would provide cover for anyone who wished to prey on the swimming children. It would also serve as a concealed passageway to the nearby Blue Star Memorial Highway. Additionally, there is a much larger wooded area across the highway, which extends all the way to the residential areas of neighboring North Andover. These wooded areas were extensively covered by sniffer dogs and off-duty green berets, but there were no signs of any struggle or scent trails. However, as one of the green berets pointed out, if Andy had been abducted right after getting out of the swimming pool, there was very little chance the sniffer dogs would be able to pick up his trail. Either he had been snatched up by an intelligent, predatory, and extremely dangerous individual, or something much more terrifying and inexplicable had occurred. Just six days after Andy was declared missing, law enforcement scaled down their search, and Andy's family was forced to face the heart-wrenching reality that he might never return alive. A week later, a man by the name of Wayne Chapman was arrested in Waterloo, New York, on suspicion of impersonating a police officer. Inside his van, law enforcement discovered indecent images of children, maps of wooded areas, duct tape, high-end camera equipment, and a single blood-stained child's sock. When confronted with the overwhelming evidence of his guilt, Chapman confessed to violating two young boys with both assaults occurring in Andy Puglisi's hometown, Lawrence, Massachusetts. Yet despite being considered a prime suspect, Chapman was never arrested or charged in relation to Andy's disappearance. And that's because, despite the mountain of forensic evidence, there was nothing that directly linked him to Andy's case, and this is where the theories get weird. In 1998, Andy's old friend Melanie Perkins rounded off seven years of hard work by releasing the documentary film, Have You Seen Andy? The feature-length documentary explores the events of that faithful August afternoon and re-examines facts surrounding Andy's disappearance. It is a thoroughly well-researched film and in the process of creating it, Melanie discovered something truly shocking. According to the case files, police have estimated that there were at least five known predators in the vicinity of the public pool on that day Andy vanished, one of whom stalked a school bus full of children with the intention of snatching one. But perhaps the most mysterious and chilling of all the film's testimonies comes from two local men named Alan and Tony, who were children during the late summer of 1976. Around a year or two after the events of that late August afternoon, Alan and Tony were walking through the woods behind the same public pool from which Andy disappeared when they made a startling discovery. Set into the forest floor, maybe 50 feet away from the public path, was a large, perfectly rectangular hole in the earth. 
It had flat sides and a flat base, the men claimed, almost as if something large had been removed from it, like a chest or coffin. When they returned two days later, the hole had been filled in again, and so effectively that it was almost impossible to discern its original location. Neither believed it was connected to the Andy Puglisi case, but when they heard about the documentary, they decided to finally break their silence. In the documentary, Melanie mentions how she once heard rumors of a forensic dig site in the woods behind the public pool and believes that this is what the two men had encountered. Alan and Tony disagree. The men claim that the deep pit appeared to be perfectly cut out of the earth, as if by a giant cookie cutter. There was no police tape, no shovels or picks, and no attending police officers to warn them away from an active crime scene. But most importantly, there were no piles of displaced earth surrounding the hole. The boys walked in the area often and dismissed any idea that they missed or simply didn't remember any law enforcement involvement. To them, the hole was there one day, then gone the next, and they've never been able to properly explain it. Those more practically minded tend to lean on Wayne Chapman as their number one suspect, or tend to have some other more rational explanation. But the mysterious hole in the ground has become a point of fascination for the more preternaturally inclined. Andy's case has since attracted the attention of readers of David Politis' Missing 411 series. The books detail a number of unsolved missing person cases, but these cases tend to fall within a certain category. The subjects are often children and tend to mysteriously disappear around forests, mountains, or bodies of water. But what makes a missing 411 case so unique is the potential for supernatural involvement. So many roll their eyes at the sound of the word, but in this case, Supernatural might not necessarily refer to Bigfoot or UFOs, but rather some other more tangible yet unexplainable phenomena. Over the past hundred years, our understanding of the physical space that we occupy has changed dramatically. From the pioneers of nuclear physics to continually evolving laser technology, even our closest ancestors would be floored at the advancements we've made. So, in another hundred years, Perhaps scientists will be able to explain how a quarter ton of dirt could just disappear and then reappear a few days later, or why a little boy might be with us one moment and gone the next. Derek James Engbritson was born on July 5th of 1990 in the small city of Klamath Falls, Oregon. He was an intelligent but shy young man with a love of the outdoors, and he had brown hair, dark eyes, and a bright smile. On December 5th of 1998, eight-year-old Derek agreed to accompany his father and grandfather to Pelican Butte, near Rocky Point, Oregon. The trio planned to look for a suitable-looking Christmas tree that they could cut down and transport back to their home. It was an annual tradition for the men of the family, and Derek was vocally excited to be the one to pick out the family Christmas tree. The trio drove out to the butte, parked their truck, and then wandered through the snowy forest, dodging Derek's snowballs as they went. Finally, they came across a suitably sized tree, and after making sure that it met Derek's approval, his father and grandfather began chopping it down. It was a scene not unlike one found on a Christmas card, but unbeknownst to the Engbritsons, it was a day that would end in a living nightmare. While Derek's father and grandfather worked on cutting down the tree that he had selected, they momentarily took their eyes off of him. They stopped watching him for no more than two or three minutes, but when they turned around again, little Derek was gone. Knowing that he couldn't have gotten too far on foot, Derek's father rushed around the forest, searching for tracks and calling out the boy's name. But bizarrely, he was nowhere to be found, and suddenly Derek's father was hit with a terrifying realization. To have disappeared so suddenly and completely, someone or something must have taken his boy. Upon realizing the gravity of the situation, Derek's father and grandfather rushed back to their truck and sped off in the direction of the nearest phone. Then, at exactly 4.13 p.m., Derek Engbritson officially became a missing person. Despite the impending loss of daylight, the Klamath County Sheriff's Department commenced their search effort immediately. 
They flooded the area around Pelican Butte with deputies and tracker hounds, and at first, their hopes were high. Derek's parents told the police how their son had grown up in the mountains, and that he had been taught a handful of cold-weather survival techniques. What's more, Derek's father mentioned that at the time of his disappearance, his son had been in possession of a small hatchet, meaning that despite being just eight years old, he had a much better chance of fending for himself than other children his age. As the police continued their search, evidence of his education was obvious. Towards dawn, deputies discovered a small rudimentary shelter made of fir boughs and fallen logs. Nearby, they found a trail of small boot prints in the snow, and after following them, deputies found that the prints looped around from the location where Derek's father had last seen him to a small woodland clearing near a highway. However, what they found there, given the circumstances, was truly bizarre. It was a snow angel, and as you might imagine, it raised a lot of questions. Since these were the only tracks found in the area, it stood to reason that they belonged to Derek, but it made no sense why he would suddenly stop to make a snow angel. There was no way he could have covered that amount of ground in the period of time his father had stopped paying attention to him, and a lost and panicked child would not be in the mood to play around in the snow. Suggestions that the snow angel was evidence of a physical struggle were dismissed because it was too well formed to be anything but deliberate. Police then tried to continue following the small boot prints, but a sudden blizzard made their efforts extremely difficult. Once the blizzard had subsided, the search resumed. Additional sniffer dogs were dispatched to Pelican Butte, and a number of Civil Air Patrol planes joined search and rescue helicopters in scanning the area from the skies. Unfortunately, not a single trace of Derek could be found, and just eight days later, the search was called off. Derek's family continued their investigation independently of law enforcement for quite some time, but came up with nothing. They were later joined by hundreds of civilian volunteers from all over North America, but once again, no progress was made. Then one day, a member of the public approached the police with some alarming information. On the day of the disappearance, they claimed to have witnessed a man struggling with a young boy in the area where Derek vanished. Additional reports were made of an unidentified man driving a two-door Honda who had been asking passerby for directions to the woods. The police made efforts to track the man down but were unsuccessful. Less than a year later, on September 24, 1999, Oregon's Harney County Sheriff's Department received a call from a horrified member of the public. They had discovered some graffiti in the bathroom of the Sage Hen Rest Area, over 200 miles away from Pelican Butte, and it referenced Derek's abduction. Upon being informed of what the graffiti said, Derek's mother told the media, I think it's just a big sick joke. If someone took Derek, if they put this on the wall, they were wanting to be caught. If they were wanting to be caught, why didn't they leave something of Derek's there? Many have speculated on exactly what was written on that wall, but to this day, it has never been made public. This is probably to honor a personal request made by Derek's family, as if they did indeed believe it was nothing but a sick joke, it would serve no purpose to broadcast it. However, based on what Derek's mother said, it's not difficult to infer what was written. Someone claimed to have taken the boy, and they most probably claimed to have kept him alive, or at least kept his body as some kind of sick trophy. The implication that they could have left something of Derek's at the truck stop strongly implies that they were in possession of some of his personal effects. In 2008, police confirmed that a man named Frank James Milligan was considered a potential suspect in Derek's disappearance. At the time, he was serving a hefty sentence for violating a 10-year-old in a town just outside of Salem, Oregon, and the modus operandi seemed identical to the one used in Derek's disappearance. But to date, Milligan has yet to be charged in connection with Derek's case, and an eventual conviction seems less and less possible. But to have snatched Derek out from right under his father's nose, Milligan would have had to have stalked the family through the woods and then creep out without making a sound and possible given the thick snow on the ground. If they were using chainsaws to chop down their Christmas tree, then it would be feasible that Derek's father didn't hear his cries, but the two men were using one axe between them which is hardly capable of making enough noise to cover a child's abduction. But if Frank Milligan isn't to blame for Derek's disappearance, who is? 
The truth of what happened to Derek that day has remained a mystery for a quarter century now, and his case is unlikely to be solved anytime soon. But the question still stands. Did Derek fall victim to a very despicable but explicable form of predator, be it animal or man? Or did something else happen out there in the woods that day? Something we're not quite ready to believe yet. Hopefully this is okay to post here. My story is not one where I was the target of someone's stalking or harassment, but one where I was the guy who was at the right place at the right time, and I'm fairly certain that my inadvertent intervention may have saved someone I'd never met. Well, who knows what. This was back in 2015 or 16. I'm a career tow truck driver. At this point, I've been towing cars for most of my adult life, and will most likely do so until I retire or die whichever comes first. At the time, I was working for a pretty small towing company with only two employees. We rotated who was on call each weekend. It was my weekend on call. It was summer. So with people being out and about late and whatnot, I was pretty busy. Cleaning up accidents, towing broken cars down both in the city and off the highway. I was fine with it, as I was paid in commission at the time. So the more calls I did, the more money I made. It's Saturday night. Now Sunday morning, it's around 2.30 to 3. And like I said, I've been busy. I'm tired, I'm a little grumpy, and I kinda wanna go home when my phone rings. It's an insurance company calling asking if we could do a tow for one of their customers who's broken down on the side of the highway. The breakdown location they gave me is about 15 miles out of town, which I normally wouldn't do, but the tow destination happens to be a dealership that's a couple of minutes from my apartment. So I contemplate rejecting the call, but because I'm paid commission, I figure, screw it. I can run up, grab this car, drop it off the corner from my place, then hopefully I can just head home and get a couple hours of shut-eye. So I take the call and hop onto the highway. The insurance company provided me with the customer's first name, which for privacy's sake we'll call her Kara, and then gave me a phone number for her. I usually try to make contact with the people who are on the side of the highway to let them know that I'm on my way and give them an ETA. I tried calling her a couple of times, but she didn't answer. Not unusual. After a short while, I see hazard lights up on the way on the shoulder, so I turn on my strobes and start slowing down. As I approach, I notice that not only is there a late model car that I'm looking for, but there's another car on the scene as well that doesn't have its hazards on, but it's parked in front of the car I'm meant to tow. This is annoying, but not uncommon as I needed to be able to get in front of the disabled car in order to load it and sometimes people don't realize that. But because the other car is there, I instead pull up behind both cars. Standing at the trunk of the late model car, which is now directly in front of me, are a man and a woman. The woman is probably in her early 20s, dressed to the nines for a night out. She's maybe 5'1 or 5'2. She's wearing tight leatherish or something pants, a halter top, long black hair, very pretty. The man is probably 5'10 and skinny, maybe 150 or 160 pounds, wearing a dark hoodie and dirty jeans. They're standing very close, facing each other. She has her arms crossed and he's leaning down talking to her. I step out of my truck and approach them both, and I introduce myself. They separate a few feet, and I look to the woman and say, Are you Kara? She nods. I say that I'm here from her insurance company. I ask what's going on with her car. Immediately, the man pipes up and says, Yeah, it's just some fuel issues. It's an easy fix. Can you just drop it off at this commuter parking lot? I'm going to fix it for her there. I'm rather annoyed at this, because the commuter lot in question is further up the highway, and I'm already 15 miles out of town. Like I said before, I only took this call because it was supposed to be coming back toward my apartment, and I really wanted to go home. Not only that, but in order to change the original tow destination, I would have to call the insurance company back, wait on hold for them for who knows how long for a representative, and then let them know of the change and try to get them to pay me extra for the deadhead miles back home, after I unload. I really didn't want to do any of this. Thirdly, this is a late model car. I'm no mechanic, but it's new enough that whatever is wrong with it is likely covered under warranty so the dealership is really the best place for it to go anyways. 
I explain all this to this guy, but he's not really having it. He gets stern with me, saying something like, Look, man, you just need to take the car where I tell you to take it. We go back and forth on this for maybe 60 seconds, and he's just getting madder and madder. Well, you know what, man? You're not the name insured. Kara is. The easy way to settle this is to ask what she wants me to do with the car. Whatever she says is what I'll do. Fingers crossed she'll want to take it to the dealership so I can get home sooner. I turn to look at Kara to ask her that question. I don't see her right away. She's no longer standing where she was a minute ago, which was slightly off to my right. I continue not to see her until I've turned almost all the way around, because she's standing directly behind me. And by directly, I mean within an inch of my back, arms still crossed. I look down at her, and she locks eyes with me. Her eyes are wide as plates, almost owl-like. Immediately, it feels like she's staring into my soul. She didn't have to say a word, and she didn't have to. I took a step back and did what I felt was like a double-double take. I looked at him, then at her, then at him again, then back at her. It slowly starts to dawn on me that maybe something isn't quite right. I ask her, Do you know this guy? And she ever so slightly shook her head no. The expression on her face when I asked her that will forever be burned into my skull turned to the guy and was like, Oh, you gotta go, man. Now, I'm not a tough guy. I'm a total beta male, if there is such a thing. And I don't care who knows it. I've got nothing to prove. I'm super adverse to confrontation and will run at the first sight of trouble. I'm not exactly the biggest of guys either. I am, however, what I'd like to call sturdy. I'm 5'8 and 240 pounds and have a bit of a gut. I also have big thighs and broad shoulders, and people are generally surprised to find out that I weigh as much as I do, and I think that might have been my saving grace for what happened next. Without a word, the guy starts to move for Kara, and I move to stay in between him. He tries to push me out of his way by shoving me in the chest, but because I believe he underestimated my weight, only pushed me hard enough to make me take a single step back. Immediately, I took that step forward toward him and body check him, hard. As hard as I could, hard enough to completely knock him over basically onto his ass. Because we rotated during the back and forth push bit, Kara is now in front of me to my right, somewhat between me and the guy who's trying to scramble to his feet. I reached out and snatched up the poor girl by her waist, spun her toward my truck, and yelled for her to get into the driver's side, and she does so. I turn back to the guy who's standing up again at this point, and he's breathing hard. He gets right up in my face but doesn't do anything, just breathes at me. I stare him right in the face, mustering up the best dad voice I can muster and just say, You need to go. I'm shaking now, absolutely terrified. I don't know if he has a weapon. Don't know if he's going to try to fight me. I don't know what I would do if he did. Like I said before, I'm not a tough guy. I don't even know how to fight. I've never been in a fight in my life. What if I get badly hurt? What if I get stabbed? What do I even do now? I just want to go home. I wasn't even going to take this damn call. All this is running through my head at lightning speed. After a probably around 15 seconds or so, which felt like eons, he huffs a bit, smiles one of the creepiest smiles I've ever seen, and starts to back up, sucking his teeth and rubbing his hands together. He slowly starts walking backward a few steps, then makes his way to the front of the car, gets in and drives off. I stayed motionless, watching him until I could no longer see his taillights. I got Kara's car loaded up onto the tow truck as we made our way to the dealership. She told me through tears that her car had shut off while she was driving. She pulled over to the shoulder, called her parents because she was on their insurance. Her parents made the call to the insurance company who eventually dispatched me to her location. While she was waiting, a bit after she made the call, the guy pulled up in front of her walked up to her passenger side window and tried to talk to her, ask if she needed help. She told him she was fine and that a tow truck was coming and she didn't need any help. He persisted and she tried to tell him off, eventually tried to roll up the window. Apparently he stuck his arm in the window and got the door unlocked and opened up the door. In fear, she jumped out of the car and ran to the back of her car and stayed put there because it was in the line of sight of traffic. Apparently, he was pretty lewd with her. Whenever she tried to go back to her car, he would prevent her from getting inside. 
Several minutes later, I showed up. Who knows what would have happened had the timing been any different. Her parents were waiting at the dealership when we arrived. She told them what had just happened. Her parents gave me a $20 tip, which was all the cash they had on them at the time. And Kara gave me a very tight and clearly heartfelt hug before I left. I never saw her again. I tell you what, every guy has daydreamed at some point of coming to the rescue of a pretty girl in trouble. Myself included. You think you're going to be a hero. That you're going to be the cat's ass. You're going to slay the dragon and get the girl and ride off into the sunset. Like the king you think you are. But for me, being in that situation, in the moment, was one of the most terrible feelings I've ever had in my entire life. Forced into a confrontation I didn't want, nor was I prepared for. Not knowing what to expect from a clearly not well-hinged individual. I didn't feel like the cat's ass. I didn't feel like a hero. I felt like a scared little kid encountering a bully on the playground for the first time. If I'm ever in a situation like that again, I will never not intervene, but I really just hope I don't have to. Thanks again for reading. Back when I was 18 years old, for about six months my boss drove me to work. I know that may sound a little weird, but I didn't get a license yet and he knew my mom. It also helped that he lived about two minutes from my house. It was just a weird situation and no matter how I try to preface it, I just know that it sounds weird. Most mornings, the drive to work was uneventful. We'd usually get to work at around 6.30 a.m. and neither one of us would talk in the car. He was usually hungover and I just wasn't the talkative type. I'm a quiet person by nature, but I was even quieter back then. One day, we had to go to work at 3 in the morning for inventory. My boss decided it would be good to show me, so I got up extra early for that 3 a.m. shift. On the way into work... That morning, my boss said that he wanted to grab some coffee at the gas station since it was the only place that was open. When we parked, as he was getting out of the car, he told me that he was going to hit the restroom as well. I just nodded and decided to wait in the car. I was exhausted from staying up way too late playing video games and I was planning on just resting my eyes until we got to work. I'm assuming a few minutes had passed, I don't know exactly how long it was because I was falling asleep while I was waiting for my boss. With no notice, the back seat door opened and it startled me in my half-asleep state. I just thought it was my boss and then I felt movement behind me. I finally looked behind me and just sitting there in the back seat was a woman. She didn't appear to be homeless or look like she was on anything, she just looked strange and we made eye contact for a few seconds and then I whipped back around trying to process what was happening. I'm a really quiet person and I was even more quiet back then like I said and I didn't know what to say or what to do. I was just hoping my boss was going to come back out soon. I started to finally work up the courage to ask what was going on and I was immediately freaked out when I turned around. She was sitting there, now smiling but looking forward. I don't really know how to describe her eyes. They were cold and dark and seemed almost lifeless even though she was kind of pretty. Even as I write this, I still can't get the image of her out of my mind. It had probably been about 30 seconds since all this started and I finally uttered my words when I asked her, Hey, is everything okay? You know this isn't your car, right? Instead of answering with words, she just started to scream, erratically. It was so erratic that it was shaking the entire car, it felt like, or maybe just my head. I jumped back just out of panic, confusion, and shock, and I saw my boss walking out of the gas station. I just dove out of the passenger side door and shut it behind me. My boss was confused and asked me what the heck was going on, and I just pointed to the woman in the back seat of his car. We both just stood there almost in amazement and disbelief. She was still screaming, shaking and rocking back and forth. We could physically see the car shaking from her wild movements from inside the car. My boss approached the back seat where she was sitting and as he grabbed the door handle, she put both her hands on the window and I kid you not, started to hiss and growl at my boss. He said, nope, and walked back towards me. I was standing probably 10 feet away at this point. 
He immediately called the police and we were hoping that they would arrive soon since it was a small town. The entire time that we were waiting for the cops, we could hear the woman screaming and the car still shaking. After a minute or two of waiting for the police, we went inside and watched her from inside the gas station. There was just something unsettling about the entire situation. She wasn't trying to rob us. She only looked like she wanted to cause harm when we got near the car. I mean, she was sitting in the back seat, so she wasn't even trying to steal the car. It was just all so weird. The cops showed up maybe five minutes after the call. We went outside to greet the officer and fill him in on the situation, and he looked confused, and I'm not going to lie, he almost looked kind of amused by the whole situation. The officer tried to get the woman to come out calmly, but after a minute of her screaming and growling, he basically went into the car and apprehended her. And this is where this bad dream truly turned into a nightmare. Upon arrest, the officer had to remove four knives from her person. Yeah, you heard that right. This woman had four sharp objects on her. Thankfully, she never showed us the knives or even hinted at the fact that she had them, but even more disturbing perhaps is the fact that she didn't have an ID on her and she wasn't talking, so the officer had no idea who she was. This complete stranger came out of nowhere. She got into my boss's car without saying a word. She went from smiling to off the wall insane. Then, to cap things off, she had no ID and four deadly weapons on her. I've had some wild things happen to me over the years, but I'd have to say that this was probably the strangest and most terrifying that's ever happened to me. It's been years and I remember this moment like it was yesterday. I'll never forget that woman's face, and I honestly wonder what she's up to now. When I was in college, I attended film school and let me tell you, I loved it. What a great experience. I met so many awesome people and learned so much. And I always loved it when we had a chance to create a short film, a chance to be able to tell stories with your unique vision. For me, I had a really hard time brainstorming and coming up with ideas while I was physically at the school. I couldn't concentrate in the dorms and the library and places like that just didn't give the creative vibe. So I started going on these long night drives whenever I needed to brainstorm. I'd throw on some tunes and just drive around letting my mind go to all sorts of wild places. On one of these night drives, I started to see flashing lights in my rearview mirror. When I looked back, the lights were getting closer and it was clear that I was getting pulled over for something. I pulled over and noticed that the car pulled over behind me and the lights went off and I just sat there for a minute or two contemplating what I could have done possibly to get pulled over like this. I took the key out of the car and set it on my dashboard. I don't know if that's like a universal thing, but I was always told when you get pulled over, put the key there. I started to look in the mirror, trying to make out any details that I could, but it was just too dark. From what I could tell, it looked like a pickup truck, but I couldn't be 100% certain. I started to have my doubts that this was even a real cop. I had just never seen a pickup truck cop car. And I started thinking that it could have been an undercover cop, but I still kept going to that same point, which was, what did I do? Finally, someone emerged from the vehicle. It was dark, but I could clearly see that this person was wearing black pants and a black hooded sweatshirt. Full alarm bells were going off because I was sure that I had never seen a cop with a hoodie on, but I didn't speed away because I still had that fear of, what if this was a cop? I would be fleeing the police and they would have my license plate and it was a whole mental battle that I was having. He looked like wobbling all over the place as he was walking towards my car and when he got to my window, which was rolled down about a quarter of the way, I could see most of his face even through the hood as it was firmly on. He starts shouting from outside the window, step out of the vehicle now. I could immediately smell the booze reeking out of his breath towards my face through the little crack in the window, and I know I'm stupid but it took me this long to finally be sure that this wasn't a real cop, and I just yelled through the window, no, grabbed my keys, and tried to start my car. While I was struggling to find the keyhole, the man shouted again that I said get out right now. He then lifted part of his sweatshirt and started to pull something out that looked like a firearm, but... I couldn't be sure. 
I just ducked down, put the car into gear and drove off as fast as I could. I couldn't enjoy any relief in that moment though, because within seconds, I now saw him following me. He didn't turn on the flashing lights, but got close enough to my car that he was straight up tailgating. If I switched lanes, he switched lanes. The speed limit on these dark roads was 45 miles per hour, and I was driving over 65 miles per hour trying to lose this guy. Before I knew it, I was almost 30 minutes away from campus, and this guy was still directly on my tail. I then did something that I had seen a million times in movies, and I couldn't believe that it actually worked. I was closing in on an on-ramp for the highway. I waited until the last possible second and then swerved over and got onto the highway, forcing him to miss the ramp or he may have crashed. About two minutes passed and I saw no lights behind me. I hoped that I had finally lost this madman. Instead of getting off at the next exit, which I had a feeling that he may have thought was my plan, I made an illegal U-turn on the highway and got to the other side. I made the short drive back and got off the exit that I got on. I had no idea where I was. I drove around slowly for a while until I found a 24-hour gas station, and I go inside and told this guy what had happened and basically just begged him to call the police in that moment, which thankfully he did. I also had to ask him for directions back to the school. Now this was before everyone had cell phones all the time, so I couldn't just GPS my way back. I had a brick phone that I usually just kept in my dorm and when the cops showed up, I gave them all the information I could, which honestly wasn't that much since it was so dark. I mean, how many people own a pickup truck and a hoodie? Probably millions. The cop was honest and told me that they most likely would never find out who the man was since I didn't get any plate information. He was super nice though and escorted me back to the school just in case that man resurfaced. I think about that night a lot and just how crazy it was and how stupid I was. I wanted to punch the past version of myself for pulling over and not reacting faster. Whenever I have a truck tailgating me at night now, I'm always reminded of that night, and I just hope that all these years later that that truck man never returns. When I was younger, each summer and almost every new year, my family would pack the car and go on a road trip to visit family in Mexico. We never had any problems until one particular trip when I was eight. Like every road trip before, we left our home in North Texas around 6 p.m. in order to reach our destination the following morning. So around 2 a.m., we crossed into Mexico. And that's when things got weird. When you're on an only stretch of freeway in the middle of a desert, you don't tend to freak out about having the same car behind you for miles. It was practically pitch black on the outside of our car windows, the only visible shapes being the dotted stars and the eerie silhouettes of the cacti. We'd been in Mexico for an hour and a half, still had a few more hours to drive, and I remember sleeping but not being semi-conscious of what was around me, because I didn't have the skill to really fall asleep in a car. So when my mother suddenly spoke my dad's name, I heard her. Miguel, that car behind us, it's been behind us since we left Laredo. My dad peeked at the car and shrugged off my mom's tension. A lot of cars use this road. He's probably going to Reynosa or another city, and left it at that. Despite his sureness, my mom kept a weary eye on that car behind us. By this time, my siblings and I were hyper aware of the car, and entertained ourselves with watching it through the gaps in the luggage that blocked the rear window. We got tired pretty quickly. He's getting closer, my mother noted. We turned to watch as the car inch closer and closer to ours. He's too close, Miguel. She was right. By this time, the car was practically pressed against the rear of our car, and on a lowly stretch of the highway in the middle of nowhere with another few hours until daylight. It was downright scary. We couldn't do much. My dad didn't slow down, didn't stop, and he didn't speed away either. He just drove, and that car followed. The next 30 minutes were the most tense we had ever experienced. The car would ease off sometimes, only to press its blinding headlights against our rear once more. Like he knew he was freaking us out, and enjoyed it. It was during one of the periods that the car had pulled away, that my mom spotted a police car up ahead, parked on the side of the road, and she did miss a beat, 
pull over right in front of the police. Pull over right now, Miguel. And he did. And that car kept driving. I wonder how confused the policeman must have been as he watched my dad park her car right in front of him. The policeman came over and asked what was wrong. My mother urgently told him everything. The car, the way it followed us and taunted us. The policeman took her claim seriously and told us how people were victimized and had their car stolen on these empty highways by thugs and criminals. Then he offered to drive behind us for a while to make us feel safer. We drove off with that police cruiser behind us, relieved. Until about 10 minutes later, when we saw something that confirmed the policeman's words and my mother's worst fears. We saw that car pulled over on the side of the road, waiting. This happened in Antioch, California. It was around 2 a.m. I was at a friend's house, safe in warm, sheltered suburbia. We were having a lot to drink, chit-chatting, enjoying ourselves. Of course, when you're having fun, time hits the fast-forward button, and those few minutes turn into an hour. I had too much to drink. My friend has a bit of an abrupt bedtime, so I had to dodge out early, still intoxicated. I felt too shameful thinking I would be asking too much to stay in his house, to sleep off the drunkenness. I suppose he was either too rude or too drunk to consider it himself. Whatever. Sometimes a little inconvenience makes you appreciate everything else. I needed about another hour or so to sober up and drive back. As fast as time passed during my stay, it decided to drastically slow down as soon as I stepped out of his house. It was a cul-de-sac area, a concrete jungle with the stem of the street breaking into a fork. Alongside the road, my car was parked. The only street light that worked was in the middle of the cul-de-sac circle, about 80 yards away. I stumbled towards my car, produced my keys, felt the metal line up, opened my door and shifted to the back seat. Because this was a dark, strange, and unfamiliar neighborhood, I took the leftover newspapers and a sweater in my back seat to cover myself up. I wanted to camouflage myself and not just be some guy awkwardly sitting in his car, waiting for time to pass in order to drive home. I couldn't fall asleep. The uncomfortable feeling of a cheap backseat bed enshrouded in darkness didn't make the chance of slumber easier. It felt too ominous. And of course, my mind began to wander. I thought of worst-case scenarios like how the police would shine their lights on me through the window, or a drunk driver hitting my car, and... Wait. In the distance, about 100 yards away, I could hear footsteps approaching. The gravel scuffed with each step forward, growing in proximity, but periodically taking stops. I wondered why, until it made sense in my mind. Whoever it was was probably looking through cars carefully, with the intent to steal one. I couldn't recall how many cars were on the block, but I counted three full stops until he was at my window, breathing. I froze. There was no more than one foot between us. The car encapsulated me as I lay hidden beneath backseat clutter, forming myself into an object trying my hardest to be unnoticeable, unmoving, and simply not there. I see you, said a 40-plus-year-old man in a perverse baby talk. Imagine when you were playing hide-and-seek and one of your friends tricks you into coming out. He said it in that tone of voice, as if baiting me like he was questioning whether the clutter in the back seat was just clutter, or a person. I did not want to move or check the window. I remained clutter. Give me an Academy Award. My body reacted by minimizing my breathing so much that I felt paralyzed. I dare not look. My eyes fixated on the back of the passenger seat. I did not blink. I did not move. 
I did not breathe. My heart was pounding so hard it shook my body with each throb. He circled around the car. My ears didn't fail me. I heard the steps. I felt like I was part of the car. I could feel him touching the trunk as he carefully pressed down on it, as if to test the alarm, as if to test me. I was in the middle of fight or flight. I couldn't do either without elevating danger. I was frozen and hoping that he was bluffing. He circled the car again. The door handle to my right jiggled. He was pulling it multiple times. I see you. Same tone, but more agitated and stressed. More convinced that he was trying to make that clutter move. Revealing itself to be of his expectations. That it was me. My muscles tensed like a cow before slaughter. Tap, tap, tap. That had to be metal against glass. Take a penny right now and tap your window. A crowbar. A knife. A rock. My eyes fixated on the seat in front of me, never averting my gaze like he was. I was covered enough to where I couldn't see beyond the seat in front of me. I know I couldn't see him, but I could feel his eyes resting on top of me. My name is Poker Face. What's your name? The voice changed in a lower, demented, and serious tone. My mind forced a visual. It wasn't anything human. I already accepted my death. I was ready to be shot in the head, ready to take a life-changing bullet, multiple knife wounds. Just make this sleep bearable, not excruciating as you drain me of life. I wouldn't know how to react. My thoughts grew dimmer. I imagined my friend waking up the next morning after a calm night of safe and sound sleep, only to discover my mutilated, defiled, and bloodied body hanging outside my car door. It was then I heard nothing but my own heart. What was this person doing now? Just staring at me in the middle of the night? Talking to me? Or a messy pile in the back seat? Time froze. The footsteps were being swallowed in the distance. He left. I waited another hour until the sun showed hints of itself. I jumped in my front seat and bolted out of there. Wide-eyed and sober. So this happened to my family in early 2002 when my daughter was a baby. My wife and I moved into a new house right after our daughter was born. It was a nice place in the suburbs. I would rather not mention in what city. The house was relatively new and surrounded by other houses with the same exact design and layout. We were still getting used to our new life there with our new baby when one night... We heard the baby crying on the baby monitor. We were watching a movie in the living room, paused it, and went into the baby's room. The baby wanted her bottle. I stood in the doorway of the room while my wife tended to our newborn. I was smiling at the sight of this, when suddenly my wife made a small sound of fear and surprise. She was looking out the window directly beside the crib. I walked over to her, and she didn't say anything. I looked outside and saw a woman that looked to be about our age standing on our lawn and looking into the bedroom window. I went into protective mode and immediately walked out of the room and towards the front door with the intention of confronting her. My wife shouted before I could open the door. She ran away! I ripped the door open and walked outside. I looked around the front of our house and walked a bit further onto the street, looking in both directions. No sign of her. I decided to walk around the whole exterior of my house to make sure this creepy lady had really left. I walked the perimeter of our house and didn't find her anywhere. I returned to my house to find my wife still holding the baby in our master bedroom, 
and I told my wife that I did not find her. After a little while of being creeped out and looking out the windows to make sure she wasn't still lingering around, we decided she was gone for good and went to sleep. The next day, we saw the woman again, this time at night. And this time, my wife was in the shower and I was holding our baby in her bedroom. I saw the woman standing in the same spot on our lawn, peering into the bedroom at me holding my baby. I just looked at her for the longest time, and she didn't move. My wife eventually walked into the room with a towel in her hair and approached me from behind, giving me a hug. I said, She's back. Look. She's just standing there. My wife got incredibly creeped out at this point and insisted that we call the police. I was going to, but felt I wanted to confront her again, so I walked out of the room and opened up the front door, which was only about 10 feet away from the baby's room. I walked outside, and the woman was still there. She turned to me. I walked onto our lawn about 20 feet away from her and said, What are you doing? If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the cops. If I ever see you around here again, I will call them immediately. The woman smiled at me, and then opened her mouth wide and let out a nightmare-inducing scream that sounded as if she was in pain. I knew right away that this woman was ill, like in the head. She turned around and ran away. This was terrifying, as I realized she was barefoot. She ran away like a little kid would, arms flailing. I went inside and my wife was already holding the phone. A couple police officers came by the house a short while later, and they said there was really nothing they could do except drive around the neighborhood a few times and keep an eye out for her. They said they would call us if they did see her. About 20 minutes after they left, they called and said they didn't see anyone fitting her description. We were disappointed, but eventually fell asleep. After taking turns looking out the windows for hours, I had assumed the woman got the hint. A month had passed, with no sign of her. Then one night, my wife and I were in bed. When I heard a noise, I awoke and glanced at the alarm clock. It read 3.32 a.m. I listened for the noise to continue, and heard giggling coming from the baby monitor. I sat up in bed and my heart stopped. I flew out of the room and into my baby's room to see nothing. My baby was asleep and my wife had followed me. I was very confused for a moment and thought I didn't actually hear anything. Maybe it was just a nightmare. My wife asked what was wrong. I didn't respond for a few seconds and then finally said, Nothing. I thought I heard something. We both sighed and walked back into our room. My wife went into the room first and upon entering, screamed and then threw herself backwards into me. I gasped and almost fell backwards onto the floor. My wife started repeating, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. My heart pounding, I replied, What? What? I forced my way past her and walked into my bedroom. The woman was sitting Indian style on our bed. I backed up out of the room and slammed the door. My wife ran and took our baby from her crib, and the three of us went outside. As I was closing the front door once we had walked out, I heard our master bedroom door open. Neither of us had our cell phones on us, so we ran to our neighbor's house and started frantically knocking on their front door. They answered very quickly and asked what the matter was. We explained, and they ushered us inside and called the police. The cops showed up shortly after, and they went inside our house. The woman was still there. They said they found her upstairs, sitting in the middle of the hallway, in the dark. I have a story I'd like to tell you all. This happened when I was 18, about 16 years ago. 
I was still living with my parents in their nice house in suburban Colorado. It was getting late one night, around 11.30 p.m. I was on the phone with my girlfriend and had decided to go up to my room and switch phones, using the one that was in my room, so that I didn't wake my parents that I now assumed were in bed. Voices downstairs echoed upstairs easily, and I had gotten in trouble for that a few times before. I told my girlfriend to hang on, that I was going to put the phone down for a minute while I went upstairs to turn on my phone. I set the phone down on the counter, right next to where it gets hung up on the wall. I quickly walked upstairs and into my bedroom. My room was cold. I left the window open. I slammed my window shut and picked up the phone next to my bed. All right, babe, one sec. I'm going to go downstairs real fast and hang up the living room phone. I set the phone down on my bed and went downstairs. I reached the last step, turned left, and stopped. The phone was now hung up on the wall. I stood there bewildered for about 30 seconds, a bit creeped out, but mostly confused. Maybe my parents came down and hung it up? No, that wasn't possible. I would have heard them, and I was only upstairs for about 30 seconds. I walked over to the phone and then turned around looking around the living room and into the kitchen. Nothing. No sign of my parents. Nobody else was in my house that night. I convinced myself that I must have hung it up before I went upstairs. Wait. No, that's not possible. Then I would have hung up on my girlfriend. I walked into the dining room and nobody was there. I walked back upstairs and over to my parents' bedroom. I pressed my ear to the door and could hear my dad snoring. What is going on? I walked into my bedroom and almost had a heart attack when I saw that my bedroom phone was now hung up. I turned around fast to the dark hallway. Nobody. I ran downstairs and to my horror, I saw the phone in the living room was now gone. I got goosebumps all over and my heart was now pounding in my chest. I ran back upstairs and into my room. I ripped open my closet, but nobody was there. I walked over to my phone and picked it up. As soon as I did this, I heard somebody say, I came in through your bedroom window. I almost dropped the phone out of fright and thought, that's impossible. My bedroom is on the second story. I turned around again expecting to see someone, but did not. I turned and opened my window. I looked outside and saw a large extension ladder there, leaning on my house, just below the bottom of my window. I dropped the phone on the ground and ran to my parents' room. I slammed against their door with fists and yelled, Open the door, there's somebody in the house! My mom opened up and was confused, with a terrified look on her face. I went into their room and my dad was sitting up in bed. I locked their bedroom door and repeated myself, there is someone in here. They have the phone. They just said something to me. My mom ran to my dad's side of the bed and grabbed his work cell phone that was still in his jeans pocket. She called the police, and they were at our front door knocking around 15 minutes later. They searched the house and found no one. They did find the living room phone, though. It was lying in the middle of the grass in our backyard. Something very creepy happened to me on Christmas. I had celebrated the holiday that morning with my family and went to see my parents. On Christmas night, I had to go into work to finish a proposal I was working on for a new potential client. I obviously didn't want to go into work, but it had to be finished. My work was in a building downtown that is fairly close to a few nightclubs and bars. My office is on the 23rd floor and in my position, I have an office, but most of this floor is filled up with cubicles in the middle. My office is in the far corner next to my boss's office, so to get to my office, I have to walk by all the cubicles. I didn't get there late, probably around 8 or 9, but there was nobody else there. This was my second time going in alone, and it was peaceful. If I let my imagination run wild, however... I would get spooked easily. 
As I walked the path next to the cubicles, I was reminded of what I was missing at home. While looking at all the Christmas lights strung up, decorating people's workspaces. There were no lights on, but it was lit up enough by all these Christmas lights. I reached my office and unlocked it. I went inside, but didn't close the door. My computer and desk faced away from my door so I couldn't see anyone that approached my door on work days through the huge glass window that I had. I found this annoying as I never knew who was knocking until I got up and opened the door. I sat down and began working as quickly as possible so I could get back home. After a while, I'd say about an hour into it, I heard the main entrance door close. I didn't hear it open, but when it closed, it made a noise that was unmistakable. I wasn't spooked at this point, just curious as to who else was unlucky enough to have to come in and finish something. I got up from my desk and walked out onto the floor. I looked around, but didn't see anybody. I said loudly, Hello? Nobody responded. At this moment, I got paranoid and freaked out a little bit because I definitely heard the main entrance door close. Somebody was either here and then left, or was still in here and not responding to me. I was just about to turn around and get back to work when I saw a head sticking up out of a cubicle on the opposite side of the floor, looking towards me. I could see that it was a man, but I couldn't make out any details of his face. I thought he must be messing with me, so I shouted over to him. What a time to have to come in, huh? Hoping whoever it was would stand up and laugh. But they didn't. The man didn't move. And this really scared me. So I tried again and said, I can see you, guy. He didn't move. I wasn't sure what to do next, and was now very on edge. So I felt through my pocket for my keys, and they were there. I started walking down the path towards the entrance door, the whole time watching this guy. As I was walking, he just watched me. I looked over at the entrance door for a second, just one second, and looked back. He was gone. After seeing this, I thought, oh my gosh, he could be moving over to me. So I jogged the rest of the way to the door and went through it. I jogged over to the elevator and hit the button. I turned around quickly, and the door closed as it made the same noise as before. The door thankfully opened immediately, and I went inside and hit the first floor button. The door closed, and I did not see the guy come out that door. I drove home and told my wife what happened. I had to call my boss and tell him as well, so that I had a reason for not finishing my proposal that night. He was understanding, and I went back in two days later with everyone else. I never found out who the guy was or what that was all about. Nothing was stolen or tampered with, to my knowledge. This happened to me about 15 years ago. I lived near the ocean, and I frequented a certain spot on the beach all the time. It was a lonely spot, and not many people ever really showed up there. This one Saturday afternoon, I was laying out in the sand, in my spot, relaxing and tanning. It's not uncommon for me to fall asleep. I did sometimes if the sun wasn't too hot on my skin. This one particular day, I did. I woke up a while later to the sun now setting, and I realized I had slept for quite a while. I looked to my left and saw a woman sitting near me in the sand, but not a towel. She was wearing jean shorts and a bathing suit top. She had really pretty red hair. At first, I didn't really acknowledge her, but after glancing at her a few times, I noticed she was just staring out into the ocean and did not turn to look at me or anything for that matter. I felt a bit of curiosity and said hello to her. She said hello back, without turning her head to look at me. Right after that, she sprung to her feet and walked away. I thought it was kinda weird, but didn't think too much of it. I'd say about 30 minutes later I packed up my stuff and left. 
Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and I had a great day relaxing there. Once I was home, I started making myself dinner. I heard my phone ring and walked over to my purse on the counter and pulled it out. It was my mom. We started talking about the usual things when I noticed a square folded piece of paper sticking out of my purse in the midst of our conversation. My mom continued talking and I pulled out the paper and unfolded it, confused, because I was pretty sure that I did not put it there. I literally dropped the phone when I read what was written on the paper. It said, I was going to rob you and stab you in the throat, but you just looked so peaceful. I picked up the phone and told my mom what happened, remembering the girl on the beach. We both nearly passed out. Hi, my name is Trevor, and this is by far the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. This happened in May of this year. I'm a 22-year-old male who's in pretty good shape, and I'm a first responder, so I've seen and dealt with pretty much everything. I live with my parents in an upper-middle-class community. The town I live in has very little to no crime in it. So here's my story. My parents left to go to Florida to visit some family, and basically left me and my German Shepherd dog alone for the week. A quick layout of the house. It's two stories, with my parents' room on the first floor. Anyways, it's night out, and I'm sleeping in my parents' room with my dog. The bed is between two windows with screens on them. They were both opened. It's about 2 a.m. and I'm just getting ready to fall asleep when I wake up to the sounds of screaming. I think nothing of it since there's a lot of kids in the area who are always out. But about 10 minutes later, I hear the same screaming again, which woke my dog up and he was also alerted. I still think nothing of it. Another 10 minutes, the screaming happens again and I noticed it wasn't a child scream, and it was only one person. It was a loud screaming sounded like someone was getting stabbed. My dog starts huffing and totally freaking out. I'm now scared shitless and unable to move. Five minutes later, and the screaming was right outside the window. It was so loud this time that my ears started ringing. My dog flips absolute shit, and I'm having a panic attack. I look out the window and I see some old woman with long gray hair and she was still screaming. I finally jump into action and I grab my dad's pistol. The only bad thing is that it was a revolver and it had no bullets, so I had to pray she thought it was loaded. I went back to the window and now she was gone. I dialed 911 and as soon as the operator answered, I then heard the front door glass break. I ran over and I see this old woman reaching into the window trying to unlock it. The scariest part of all of this was that her arm was rubbing right against the broken glass, cutting her very deep, but she wasn't even reacting to it. She was giving me the thousand yard stare while laughing and screaming. I'm literally crying at this point and I had pointed the gun right at her. She sees the gun, and then just starts yelling. Do it! I dare you! And as much as I wanted to, I couldn't since I had no bullets. And then suddenly, I then see lights going down my street. The woman pulls her arm away, and starts walking back slowly while still staring at me, and laughing. I can then hear the cops yelling. Drop the knife, ma'am! The cops took my statement and I later found out that she was actually a psych patient who had escaped the hospital, and that she even broke into a trailer nearby and stabbed a couple. The last I heard, they were okay, but why my house out of all the others? I had my door fixed and all the blood cleaned up. My parents later called me because they had heard that there was a break-in in the area. 
I had to tell him it was our house, but to not worry. To that crazy old who tried stabbing me, I hope you're getting the proper care and help that you need. Years ago, I was living in a relatively nice and quiet duplex and worked as a contractor for a small company. It was the winter of 2016, and while the area I lived in was lonely, I always enjoyed what I was grateful for in life. I won't name the town I was in, but figure the Ocala type area. Those who have been around there will probably know what I'm talking about when I say rural. Grasslands, rolling hills, and scattered forms of civilization amongst roads. While it got lonely at times, it wasn't always like that. I lived with my miniature dachshund Sadie, big bark, small bite, and was the most precious thing in the world. She was my comfort dog and would always be there for me when I was feeling down. One day, I had just got back from work and started up the stove to heat up some food. Midway through my cooking, I hear Sadie begin to bark at my bedroom door for some reason. Completely oblivious, I just assume it was her being bored and focused on dinner. However, she still continued to bark, even after I told her to stop. Assuming she just wanted to go into my room to play with her toy, I open my bedroom door and she basically flies in and begins to bark under my bed. My heart sank into the pit of my stomach as it was clear she was chasing something. At this point, she's going absolutely nuts, barking at something under my bed while trying to get under. Assuming it was probably a lizard or a roach, I grab her and put her out in the kitchen where she thankfully quieted down. My duplex is located right next to a wooded area, so it wasn't uncommon for small, unwanted critters to scurry around. No matter how many times the landlord called in the exterminator, the problem always persisted. After I ate, I put my plate in the dishwasher, got ready for bed, and went to sleep for about an hour before waking up to Sadie barking. This somewhat bothered me, as I had to work early and I couldn't sleep with her barking. As I sat bolt upright, trying to grab her, she then jumps off my bed and begins to bark under the bed again. Now I felt that she was trying to tell me something, and so I get up and look under my bed with my flashlight. Laying under my bed was the face of a man smiling at me with these abnormally large eyes. He was clearly older than me, I would estimate 50s, but I didn't see all of his facial features. He puts his finger to his lips and makes a shushing sound. That's when I scream my head off and yell at the person hiding under my bed to get out of the house. When I didn't hear a response or see him come out, I ran to the bathroom and locked the door behind me. For those wondering, yes, I took Sadie with me. The reason why I didn't go out the front door was because I had already locked it and my key was on the other side of the bed along with my phone. Within a minute, I could hear his heavy footsteps approach the bathroom door, followed by a light tap. He then proceeds to mess with the lock on the bathroom door, trying to open it with God knows what. Keep in mind that I haven't fully seen this guy, so I didn't know what he had on him. After some time of him trying to pick the lock, he says in a slow, creepy voice, I know you're in there. You know I could break this door down in two seconds, right ma'am? That was when I realized that this person was dangerous and that he wasn't going to give up that easy. The only thing I could do was to jump out the small glass window and out onto the street. Then, as if things couldn't get any worse, the window wouldn't move up due to the ice surrounding it. It was frozen shut, not knowing what else to do. I go into the shower and unscrew the shower head and use it to smash open the window. I go through first and trample onto the snow with my shoulders bleeding from the broken glass. I carefully grab Sadie, making sure she didn't get hurt, and from there we go over to the neighbor's house and call the police. 
The neighbors were hesitant before saying yes, but wanted to stay out of it as they didn't want to get involved. The police had come sooner than expected and went into the house and came out with the guy. However, he didn't try to get away. He kind of just went with it, accepting his defeat. After he was detained, one of the officers had come to me and told me something disturbing. The minute they went into my room, everything was wiped out. My bed, furniture, TV, and computer were all destroyed and ruined. Turns out, he had also managed to get in the bathroom by breaking down the door. The bathroom has one of those strong metal doors, so for him to break it down just shows how strong he was. The cops had given me some criticism about how I went about reporting this wrong and that I shouldn't have locked myself in the bathroom. At the time, I felt that he was being insensitive or blaming me for my wrongdoing. However, then I remembered that these were police and probably deal with situations like these every day. If I hadn't thought of the idea to break the window, God only knows what would have happened to me. Hurt, kidnapped, or worse. I haven't heard of the man since, and I had since moved out of that area. Sadie had unfortunately passed away in late 2018 due to a cancer tumor that I had caught during its late stage. While she may not be with me now, her soul still remains and I thank her for alerting me about the man. I love you, Sadie. I live alone in a somewhat busy neighborhood. This happened about a year ago. It was the winter time, and I live in a climate that typically gets a lot of snow. Not only was there already some snow on the ground, but it was also very cold. One night, I was at home by myself when it started to snow a lot. I had heard about a large snowstorm that was supposed to hit the area, so I had no intentions of going anywhere. Luckily for me, I was working at home for the next several days. Pretty soon, the snow really started to come down. I looked out my window occasionally to see more snow each time. It was very heavy snowfall as well. Soon it was nighttime, and I was really glad that I didn't have to be anywhere. Occasionally, a snowplow would drive down my street, but other than that, it was very quiet. At probably like 7 p.m., suddenly there was a knock at my front door. I found this to be pretty odd. I walked over and looked out of the window. A young woman was standing there. I didn't see a car or anything, so I didn't know where she had come from. But at my house, from my front windows, I don't have a very good view of the street or even my driveway. I didn't know who she was, and she wasn't really dressed for the weather. She just had pants and a sweatshirt on, and appeared to be in her early 20s. I opened the door and asked her what she was doing out in this snowstorm. The woman asked me if she could come inside my house to warm up. Her story was that her ex-boyfriend kicked her out of his car and then drove off, or something like that. I asked her if there was anybody that could come and pick her up or something. She said that she had just called her mom, and she was going to come. I didn't really like the idea of somebody who I didn't know coming inside of my house. For some reason, I felt like it was a bad idea. But I did feel bad for her with it being a snowstorm and everything, so I allowed her to come inside. I told her she could wait right inside the door. When you enter the front door at my house, it's kind of between the living room and dining room. The front door is on the left side of the house. The living room is to the right and the dining room is straight ahead. After the woman entered, she made a beeline walking straight into the dining room. I was really confused, but I didn't say anything. I just watched her. She kind of said something quietly like, sorry, one second. Then she walked all the way to the back of the house and was going out of my sight. I started to walk closer to her to see what she was doing. As soon as I looked around the corner and saw her again, she was at the back door of my house and opening it up. My first thought was wondering why she was going back outside if she wanted to come inside so badly. But that thought was interrupted when I saw the door open and two men suddenly walked right inside of it. I couldn't believe it. At that point, for me, my instincts just kicked in. I instantly turned and ran the opposite direction. I ran towards my hallway where my bedroom and bathroom was. I heard multiple footsteps coming after me, but they were still a ways back. After I got inside my bathroom, I closed the door and locked it. But just seconds later, somebody tried opening the door. There were multiple people outside of my bathroom now. Nobody said anything though, including me. After the door wouldn't open, there were a few loud bangs on it. 
I got out my phone to call the police, but did not feel safe staying in the bathroom. So right after dialing 911, before I spoke to the operator or anything, I tried opening my window as quickly as I could. I probably did it in record time, and then I jumped out of my bathroom window and landed on a bush that was covered in snow. Then I ran through the deep snow in my yard and fell several times trying to run fast. I made it back to my feet quickly though, and eventually I got around my house and to the street. I just kept running until I made it as far away from my house as I could. Then I was finally able to talk with the 911 operator. I said everything that happened, and after that I walked down my street far away and waited until the police arrived. I didn't have a coat on or anything, but the crazy part is that I wasn't even cold at all. My adrenaline was going too much. When the police got there, the woman and the two men had taken off. I got back to my house to find it a mess. There was stuff all over the floor and a few things were stolen. It could have been much worse though, as I saw they didn't go in every room. They probably realized after I got away that they would have limited time before the police got there. I feel very lucky that I made it out safely. I'm not sure what those people would have done if I had stayed. Would they have tried to hurt me? I hope not, but I will never know. Since that happened, I don't answer my door to anybody that I don't already know. I also have installed a ring doorbell, which would have been nice to have at the time of the incident. I'm hoping nothing like that ever happens again. This story happened years ago when I was still in high school. During that time, I was pretty busy. I went to school five days a week and then worked a part-time job at a nearby restaurant. One time in the winter, I had heard all week that a big snowstorm was coming. It was supposed to hit in the afternoon, and this was not good because I had to work after school until 8 p.m. Luckily though, the snow held up a bit. It started just towards the end of my shift, and as I was driving home, it started to intensify. I was able to make it home safely though, and then it really started coming down. After I made it home, I did some homework and then went into my bedroom to play video games. It was a Friday night, so I had no school the next day. I also didn't have to work. My parents went to bed at probably like 10 or 11, but I wasn't planning on going to bed for a while. My bedroom was on the front side of the house and across and down the hallway a little bit from my parents. Usually, I had my windows covered, but on this night, I left the cover half open. I enjoyed seeing the snowfall and found it to be relaxing. So I was there having a great time, just gaming in my room during a snowstorm when something really strange happened. Something out of the window caught my eye, so I glanced out to see. What I saw was a man walking down the sidewalk in front of our house. He was pretty far away, but I didn't recognize him. I knew most of our neighbors, and I wondered what this guy was doing out walking at almost midnight in the middle of a blizzard. I kept my eye on him as he continued to walk down the sidewalk. But then he turned and began walking into our front yard. I thought this was really strange and I paused my game to see what the man would do. He then walked right into our front yard and then cut through the grass and went towards our front step. My heart started racing when I saw this. I was still trying to figure out what exactly was going on. He was now out of my sight though, so I carefully and quietly left my bedroom. I went down the hallway and then stopped at the end of it. I looked around the corner carefully. We had a large front window that had a shade over it, but you could still basically see people on the other side, or at least you could see their shadows. I didn't want him to see mine. He was standing at the front step, I could tell. I was expecting him to knock on the door or ring the doorbell any second, but he didn't. He was just standing there in silence. This went on for probably a minute or two, then the man started walking away. He was going back through the yard and then he stopped at the window. I jumped back when I saw this. The man was standing right next to the living room window and possibly trying to look in. I really couldn't tell though. I quietly went back into my bedroom down the hallway. When I got in, I was listening closely if I could hear anything. After a few moments, I looked out of my window towards where the man had been before. He was gone now. I left my bedroom and went to the end of the hallway and looked out. I didn't see the man out the front window. He wasn't at the front step either. I was wondering where he had gone and hoping that he had left. I then went to each and every window and looked out all of them. Most of them were fine until I got to the back of the house. 
Before I looked outside the kitchen window, which looked out to the backyard, I saw the guy. I jumped back, and I didn't think that he saw me. He was now standing on the back patio, a few feet away from the back door. I ran back to my bedroom, terrified. When I got there, I was debating what to do. Should I call the police, wake up my parents, or just hide in my room and hope that the man would leave? Then, about a minute later, as my mind was still racing and thinking of what to do, I heard a knock at the front door. I went back out into the hallway and looked. The guy was now back on the front step. I was definitely not going to answer the door. The man did not knock again, though. He stood there for several more minutes and then just turned and walked away. He left the front step, this time walking straight back. I went back to my bedroom and watched the guy walk back to the sidewalk and then out of sight. I still had no clue as to what he had been doing. I stayed up that night until after 2 o'clock in the morning. The man didn't return. Eventually, I fell asleep, and the next morning, everything was fine. I told my parents about it, but they figured it was just a drunk neighbor or something. Maybe it was, but I know that was the most creeped out I've ever been. I still remember how scary it was to see him outside of our house. Luckily, he never came back. This story occurred when I was driving back home from work one night. It was snowing like crazy and had been for quite some time. I got off of work late, which was not good news for me, because when I got back to my car, I had to clear off all of the snow with a snow scraper, and there was probably like three or four inches on top of it already. Then I got inside my car and left, and quickly realized that the driving conditions were not safe at all. It was probably 10 p.m. at this point. I drove very slowly on the roads, and there seemed to be hardly anybody else out driving. It would normally take me about 15 minutes to get home. This time, though, I think it took almost 30. Basically the entire way back, I really only noticed one car, and it was driving behind me. I don't even remember at what point it started to drive behind me, but I think it was pretty early on. Each time that I turned, I didn't expect the car to turn with me, but it did. By the time I was almost home, I assumed that it was one of my neighbors. The roads were so slippery that you had to take every turn very slow. When I turned onto my street, the car behind me did as well at a very slow speed. I was pretty sure that it was a neighbor. There are a lot of other houses on my street and I don't know everyone. So when I got to my driveway, I turned and pulled in. The car following me kept going down the street. I have a garage at my house, but it's detached. I drove up to it and then opened the garage, drove inside, and then closed the garage door. Then I turned my car off and got out. After that, I got my bags from the back seat. Then I left the garage to walk to the house. But as soon as I opened the garage door, I saw a car parked in my driveway. It must have been the same one that had seemingly been following me. I was really confused and didn't know what was going on. I made it between my garage and house and had to walk around to the front door. When I saw the car, I stopped for a second and thought about what to do. I couldn't tell who was driving the car because of it being dark out and the headlights, plus all the snow. I didn't know who it was or what they were doing here. Instead of confronting them or something, I decided not to. I chose to ignore them and walk right past. Looking back, it was kind of weird, but I just wanted to get inside. I figured they would probably drive away, plus it was snowing and it was safer inside. I turned and began walking along the front of my house to the door. When I was about halfway there, I heard the door to the car open. Whoever had been inside must have gotten out. I kept walking and didn't bother to turn around, and when I just about made it to my front door, finally decided to look over. When I did, I saw a man standing there next to the car, wearing a really creepy looking clown mask. It sent a shiver down my spine. I hurried and unlocked the door and then got inside. He didn't move though. He just stood there. It was really creeping me out, and after getting inside, I went to the other end of the house. I wanted to just ignore it. When I went back a few minutes later, he was gone. The car and the guy in the clown mask. I was happy to see that, but the whole situation still seemed really odd to me. Why would somebody follow me in that bad of a snowstorm? The driving conditions were terrible. Then he just stood there, staring at me like a complete weirdo. It's something that still leaves me wondering today. This happened back when I was a teenager. 
I think I was 14 years old and probably a freshman in high school. It was the winter time and sometime in the early evening. The sun had set and it was dark out. We were getting a large snowstorm and I was sent outside by my mom to shovel the driveway. She was cooking and said that food would be ready when I got inside. It was kind of my job to shovel the driveway and I didn't really mind it. When it was snowing this badly though, it could be tough. We had a pretty long and straight driveway and I needed to shovel it now even though it was still snowing. That way, the next morning, instead of having like a foot of snow to shovel, there would be less and it would be faster and easier. I went as quickly as I could and things were going pretty well. Our neighborhood was generally pretty quiet and not that many neighbors were outside or anything. We also lived on a cul-de-sac with only about 10 houses on it total, so I pretty much knew all the neighbors and their cars and stuff. When I had reached near the end of the driveway and was shoveling the last section, I heard a car coming onto the street. It entered our street and then came around the corner going very slowly. It was a larger and older looking black SUV. It looked to be a Chevy Suburban. I had never seen it before and wondered whose it was. It slowly drove past me as I shoveled and then went to the loop of the cul-de-sac. It went around there and then started to come back down the street. At that point, I guessed that it was somebody who was on the wrong street. They were probably just going to go back around, but they were going extremely slow. Then they started to slow down in front of our driveway and it kind of creeped me out a little bit. They moved past though, but then pulled over on the side of the street right in front of our house. It was only about 50 feet away from me. I wondered who on earth it could be. In fact, I wanted to just run back inside of my house right then and there, but I figured that would be weird and decided to just keep shoveling. The car sat there with the engine running and nobody got out of it. I glanced, but I couldn't see who was inside at all. It was not a good angle to see the driver, plus it was dark out and the windows were tinted. I shoveled, trying to hurry up and finish so I wouldn't have to be creeped out by this strange vehicle. The SUV then shut off, but nobody got out. After probably two or three minutes of the SUV just sitting there, the door finally opened. I was now almost at the complete end of the driveway. I saw a man get out of the car, and then he began walking over to me. He was kind of tall and thin and wore a black jacket and jeans. He also wore a winter hat and had sort of long hair. When I saw that he was walking straight for me, I really wanted to just get out of there. I told myself not to though and I shouldn't be afraid of people. The guy walked right up to me and said hi. I said hi to him and was really nervous. The guy asked me if I wanted some help shoveling and said that he could help me. I told him no thanks and that I was just about done. He then asked me if I lived there and I said yes. He just stood there for a few moments as I finished up the shoveling. Then he said something that really creeped me out. The guy asked me if I wanted to ride anywhere. I asked him why. He said, I could take you anywhere you want to go right now if you want. I was really confused by this. I said no to the man and that I was supposed to go inside now. I started to walk away. The guy stood there and watched me as I started heading back. When I made it about halfway up the driveway, I heard him walking back to his car. It was a relief. When I made it back inside, I told my parents about the guy. We looked out the window, but he was gone now. This was one of the stranger things that had ever happened to me. But that night, I stayed up kind of late. It was probably like 10 p.m. and I looked out of my window and noticed that the SUV was back. I really couldn't believe it. I kept my eyes on it and could see that the engine was running. The same man was probably inside and I was hoping that he wouldn't get out. I really just couldn't believe that he had come back. He was parked in the exact same place as before. Then, after about a minute, the truck drove away. I went and told my parents. My dad went outside, but the man was long gone by then. After that night, I never saw the truck or the man after that. The story still gives me the creeps when I think back to it though. I don't know why the guy came down our street or what he was doing. I'm really glad that he didn't try to make me go with him or something. Looking back, I probably should have gone inside as soon as I saw the car parking in front of our yard. We moved to Connecticut the summer before I entered sixth grade in 2001. We moved into a beautiful new house in one of the most beautiful towns I'd ever seen. It was a bit more rural than we were used to in New Jersey, but it was an adjustment. My sister is two years younger than me and she was going into fourth grade at the time. We came from a neighborhood where we were all super close and everyone knew one another. 
Block parties every summer and kids running back and forth to one another's houses, and we were sad to leave it. Within the first few weeks, we met some of our neighbors. Everyone was what we soon defined as very Connecticut. It was all a bit surface and nobody had that New Jersey warmth that we had been used to. In particular, our neighbors directly across the street seemed a bit odd. The mom would come over to vent to my mom about her sons and husband, and my mom was a sweetheart and was very welcoming and warm. The holidays came around and the neighbor boy across the street was in my sister's fourth grade class. My sister came back slightly alarmed with what had happened in class that day. The students were asked to make a Thanksgiving turkey out of a trace drawing of their hands. On each finger, they were supposed to write things that they were thankful for. The neighbor boy wrote things like, being a loser, hating myself, etc. Very, very dark things for a fourth grader. Fast forward to Christmas and my mom hears that they have nowhere to go for the holidays, so she politely invites the mother and two of her sons to our annual Christmas Eve party. The boys were so strange. They listened to Japanese techno with headphones on and didn't speak to anyone. They headed straight to our basement to play video games. It was weird. The younger one though was always much stranger than the older one, and the neighbor mom would always open up to my mom and aunt about how he would hurt himself, and how he needed to be put in special needs programs, but that he could never quite be diagnosed. They thought that he was on the spectrum at first, but that quickly proved to not be the case. We always assumed that she'd been confiding in them because my aunt was experienced with special needs kids and that she was looking for advice from her. The Christmas Eve stands out to me because they were at our home in a very intimate setting, but we saw them on a daily basis. My sister and I would come home from school telling my mom about how weird the younger neighbor boy was and that something was just really off about him. I will never forget her telling us just to be nice to him and that we don't know what he's capable of. That struck me as so odd at the time, but we listened. I don't know if his mother told my mom something that scared her and made her say that, or if she just had a gut instinct. Recently after that, and I can't quite remember if this was in middle school or high school, I think I was in ninth grade, and my sister and young neighbor boy were in seventh, so we all rode the bus together. What my mom then said stuck out in my mind, so today I decided to be friendlier than usual. There was snow on the ground and the younger neighbor boy was drawing something in the snow and muttering to himself. I decided to greet him. Hey Adam, what's going on? Nice morning today, huh? He made no eye contact. I'll bomb you, he said, still making no eye contact. We let it slide. We came home and told my mom. She reiterated, just be nice. We have no idea what this kid's capable of. Keep in mind, we were kids. We didn't know what to take seriously and what not to. I wished we had done more. Keep in mind, he wasn't someone who was bullied or made fun of. He was always off in the sense that he could not hold eye contact or hold a conversation or even a hello. Kids didn't make fun of him. He was a loner, but it seemed to be by choice. I never knew why we were cautious or afraid around him other than the fact that he showed zero warmth and zero humanity. We knew he had special needs, so we never really second-guessed anything and just tried to be polite as possible. When the bus would drop us off at all of our respective houses, he would run all the way up his driveway on the hill with his hands by his sides and then would turn around and make this weird hiss noise at everyone, making claws with his hands. It was always so odd, but again, we were kids and there's always a couple of kids in school who are a little strange. We took it as just that. They were invited to several Christmas Eve parties, so memories kind of blend here. One year, the neighbor mom started screaming at my innocent grandmother for being a Yankees fan as she was a Red Sox fan. It was beyond strange, because my grandma is the cutest little lady of all time and was in no way trying to argue over sports. It was though as the woman clearly had a weird switch go off. She was always nice to me, but I'll be honest, we always rolled our eyes every single time my mom invited them over. It was always such forced conversations with her, and as a teenager, I wanted nothing to do with being cornered into another chat. I think she must have just been lonely. The following and final year they were invited to Christmas Eve was when she got into it with my mom about having guns in the house. The boys only attended the first couple of Christmas Eve, so it was just the mom this time around. The topic of guns came up. 
The neighbor mom started telling my mom about how she has guns in the house and how she takes her younger son to the shooting range all the time. My mom said that she didn't agree with having guns in the house. She wasn't trying to argue, but the neighbor mom got out of hand about it. Very defensive and ultimately getting aggressive about how she grew up in New Hampshire and that's just the way of life out there. The neighbor mom told us about how brilliant that her younger son was and that he hacked into some of the government's highest levels of security and that the CIA showed up on his doorstep. We have absolutely no idea if this story is true or not, but this is what she told us, so it became our ongoing joke when anything strange happened at our house. There were a few odd things that happened throughout the years. Our internet had clearly been messed with, lights would flicker in the house, and we would joke that it was the younger boy each time. It wasn't until December 14th, 2012, that we knew just what he was capable of. I was out of college working outside of Philadelphia, my sister still a student in college, and my youngest brother a student at the high school. It was the worst day of all of our lives. My dad heard the gunshots in the morning that killed the neighbor mom, Nancy Lanza. He assumed it had been a hunter in the area, maybe a little closer than usual. That is until the FBI showed up and had to evacuate the house as snipers had lined our driveway. My mom was at the mall and we were all frantically calling one another as the news slowly broke throughout the day. At first they had his identity all wrong and said it was his brother, but we knew it had to have been him. Thank God for my mom making sure we were as nice as possible, although I don't know that it would have stopped him. I wish we had done more at the time. I wish we knew to do more at the time. We didn't. We didn't want to assume the worst out of someone, but I wish we had. Approximately 20 students and 6 teachers were killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School that day. The worst act of evil I have ever experienced so directly in my life and I hope I will never experience again. I'm very thankful that we survived growing up across the street from him, but I'm so gutted for those who didn't get so lucky. I hate it so much. I know I will never see him again, but regardless, Adam Lanza, you sick and twisted individual, I pray and hope to God that we never see you again. I used to work at a gas station many years ago. I was the clerk in the convenience store that we had, and it was open 24 hours. So, as you can guess, I worked overnights, and when I did, I would be all by myself. Now, the gas station was located across the street from some stores, such as Target and a few others, so the area would get a lot of traffic during the day. A highway was also nearby, and the gas station was on a corner. At night, though, all of the other businesses nearby closed by 10 or 11. Things would be very quiet until probably 6 a.m. or so. I worked almost every night for a while and was getting used to being there overnights. It was mostly pretty quiet and the gas station would get cars here and there, but people rarely came inside. Between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m., the average amount of people that came inside was probably about four or five, so roughly one per hour. One night I was working and it was a typical quiet night. By now, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. I was behind the counter and nobody else was inside. No cars were at any of the gas pumps either. At one point, I saw a car pulling in from the street. It was a white van. One of those typical creepy looking ones that was kind of old as well. It slowly drove up and parked in one of the spaces out front. I expected somebody to get out of the van and come inside, but instead, the van just sat there for a while. I didn't really have anything better to do other than to watch it, so I did. I couldn't tell who was driving, but soon I realized that they probably weren't going to come inside. After sitting there for maybe 20 minutes, the van eventually backed out. I thought it might leave, but instead it drove around to the side of the building. There was a few more parking spaces there, and it was now out of my sight. I honestly found this a little bit odd, and in the middle of the night, sort of creepy as well. I always tried my best not to let anything scare me though working overnights. After the van went to the side of the building, probably an hour or so went by. Now it was well past 3 a.m. Nobody came inside the store, and in that hour only one car got gas. Then I noticed that somebody was walking on the sidewalk up towards the entrance. It appeared to be a man, and he had come from the side where the van had gone before. Could this be the driver? 
He was wearing a large black winter jacket, and the hood was up. But he was looking down, so I couldn't really see his face at all. He made it to the doors, and then walked inside. After entering, the man walked to the right and away from me at the counter. After disappearing down an aisle, I focused my attention back down to my phone. Several minutes went by. When I looked up again, I noticed that the man was just standing there, about 40 feet away from me. He was facing me and looking in my direction, with an angry look on his face. His hands were in his pockets, and I was confused as to what he was doing. After glaring at me for like 10 seconds, he didn't move or look away. I said hi to him, and asked him if I could help him with anything. He didn't answer me, and just kept standing there. Then I asked him if he was okay. The man still didn't answer me. I was really confused, and not sure what to do. After standing there for a few more seconds, the man then turned and slowly walked out. Then he walked back down the sidewalk and returned to the side of the building. Less than a minute later, I saw the white van drive away. I was really glad that he was gone. The rest of my shift was pretty quiet. Eventually, a few more people came in. I was trying to figure out what that guy was doing though for the rest of my shift. His behavior was just really strange. I worked almost every night back then. And probably three nights later, I was working and it was about 2 a.m. or so. Once more, I was by myself and there were no customers. It was very quiet. Then I saw a car pulling into the gas station. And I soon realized that it was an old white van, just like the one from the other night. I remembered what had happened the other night, and I just hoped that it was not the same guy. I was already feeling creeped out. The van slowly drove around the gas pumps and over to the parking spaces out front. Then it turned and started to back into one of the spaces. After it parked, the van sat there for several minutes. But all of a sudden, I heard a car door open and soon saw what appeared to be the same man walking around it. He went to the very back of the van and opened it up. A short time later, he emerged holding something that looked like a crowbar. Then he closed the back doors to his van and started slowly walking to the entrance. He was wearing the same thing as the time prior had a bad feeling as I watched him slowly walk into the entrance doors. After getting inside, he then turned and started walking towards the back of the store. Quickly he went out of my sight, and everything in the store became extremely quiet. About five minutes went by. Then, all of a sudden, I heard a crashing sound. It seemed like the man had hit something, probably with his crowbar. I heard another sound after that. It was like he was just whacking stuff. Several seconds into this, he seemed to move closer and then I saw him appear in an aisle a ways away. I got out from behind the counter and ran out of the store. They weren't paying me enough to stay in there and deal with it. I ran all the way to my car and got inside of it. Then I called the police. I waited there with the doors locked, watching the store. I was parked behind the gas pumps, so I was a decent ways away from the store. Probably about three or four minutes after I called the police, I saw the guy leaving. He slowly walked out and went back inside of his van. Then he drove off. Less than a minute after he left, the police arrived. I told them that the man was gone, and we went inside the store to see that lots of things were off the shelves. It was all messed up from the guy whacking it with his crowbar. It was like he had gone on a rampage. We watched the whole thing unfold on surveillance tapes, and the guy was just whacking stuff. Then he calmly left. It was the craziest thing that I had ever seen. After that incident, the police investigated to try to look for the guy. They also had a police officer at the store overnights for the next week or so. The guy didn't come back, and I didn't work there for much longer either. I'm glad that I quit that job, because ever since it happened, I was really nervous working there at night. This happened back in 2003. I used to work at a Walgreens. And if anybody doesn't know, it's a popular pharmacy store chain that also sells lots of other items. The stores are not that large usually, and generally never too busy either. Most of the time, there's a pretty calm feeling inside. The store that I worked at used to be open 24 hours. I'm not sure if it still is, but I know that it was when I worked there. So usually, when I was working overnights, I would be all by myself for most of my shift. There really wasn't a need to have anybody else there because I could handle everything and we never got that many overnight customers. 
I was also able to walk to and from work, which was very nice. I had an apartment that was just down the street and a couple of blocks over, so it would only take me about 10 minutes. Usually, I work 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., and it wasn't that late yet when I walked to work and wasn't too early when I walked back. One time when I was working an overnight shift, everything was going normal, and it was about 1 a.m., I believe. I remember that I heard the automatic doors opening and glanced over to see a woman entering the store. She appeared to be about 40, had dark brown hair, was maybe 5 foot 2 or 5 foot 3, and pretty thin. After entering, the woman looked in my direction and said hi, and I said hi back to her. She then walked down one of the aisles, and I focused my attention elsewhere. I was just standing behind the counter at the checkouts. We only had two check lanes, but most of the time only had one open. Several minutes went by, and I occasionally saw the woman, but I wasn't watching her or anything. She just seemed to be shopping normally. But at one point, I was just casually looking around, and I saw the woman standing like half behind an aisle. She was holding a small video camera, it appeared, and holding it in a way that it looked like she was filming me or taking my picture. I looked at her wondering what was going on. It was like she was kind of trying to hide it too, because she was about halfway obscured. I found this really strange. After a couple of seconds of this, her camera went down suddenly and she disappeared behind the aisle. I thought that it was odd, but not the biggest deal. About a minute later, the woman walked up to the left near the exits. She said goodnight to me as she walked out without even buying anything. I said goodnight to her, but was a little bit weirded out by the whole experience. But after she was gone, I quickly forgot about it. I mean, yeah, it was strange that she was filming me or whatever, but it's not the creepiest thing in the world. Hours went by and several more customers came in. All of them were pretty normal. When 6 a.m. arrived, I was off and another coworker was there. I left Walgreens and then headed back to my apartment by walking along the sidewalk. It was still dark out and things were very quiet. Just the occasional car would pass me by on the road. As I was walking back though, one thing that was a little different was that I heard somebody walking a ways behind me. There was footsteps, but a good distance away. I was sort of curious, but didn't look back until I crossed over one block. As I did, I glanced over and the same woman was walking. I found this really strange. After I crossed the street, I crossed another, and then went along that sidewalk that would take me all the way back to my apartment. I didn't think the woman would do the same, but she did. That's when I started to get really creeped out. Her whole personality just seemed kind of mysterious, even when she had spoken to me saying hi and bye. The woman continued to walk behind me, but was a long ways back. Soon, I reached my apartment. I was really glad to see that she hadn't seemed to gain on me or anything. She was still about the same distance behind. Now, you had to use your key to enter the apartment building, and then I had a separate key for my unit. This made me feel better if I could just get inside. Who knows why this lady was following me, but I knew that she didn't live here. I entered my building and then went up to my apartment, which was on the second floor. My apartment was at the front side of the building, so I could look out onto the street where the woman had been walking. After I got inside, I went to the window and looked out. I saw the woman standing there on the sidewalk. She had her camera out again and was appearing to take a video of me at my window. This was just really strange. I ducked down to get out of her sight. Now she was just taking a video of my apartment window. What was the point of this? After several minutes, I looked again and she was gone. I went on with my normal routine after that. I would relax after work and eventually fall asleep. Obviously, my hours of being awake were very different than most people with me having to work overnight hours. So I fell asleep that day, probably at around nine o'clock in the morning or so. When I woke up, I remembered that it was almost 2 p.m. That was a little bit earlier than I usually woke up. But then, I remember hearing the sound of somebody trying to open my apartment door. I walked over to the door and then looked through the peephole. What I saw was a woman walking away. I just barely saw her, but it was the same woman from before. I was now extremely creeped out by this. After she left, I didn't know what to do. I watched her leave the building and then walk away down the sidewalk rather quickly. I really don't know how she got in probably snuck in as somebody else was leaving, which is very possible. I decided to call the police and tell them everything. 
They came out to investigate, and I gave them all the information that I could. I didn't really know what else to do. They said they would look into it, and after that, I never heard anything more. I also never saw the woman again. It still creeps me out when I think about it. Obviously, I don't work at Walgreens anymore, and haven't for many years. I also don't live in that apartment, or even the same city anymore. I still wonder what that woman was doing, though. A few years back, I was working as an overnight security guard at a company. I don't remember exactly what company it was, but it wasn't that popular or anything. I worked at a lot of different places back then doing security. It was an easy job because I would just sit at a desk all night. Literally nothing ever happened. Most shifts, I wouldn't even talk to anyone. Sometimes one or two at most. I could just go on my phone and look around and get paid for it. But at this one particular company, it was a pretty standard office building for the most part. Now inside was a lobby and I would sit at a desk in there and had a computer with some basic information. The building was not really near anything else in particular and was slightly more secluded. The only other people there overnight was a security guard and a janitor. The other security guard would mostly just be outside and I knew both him and the janitor and didn't see them very much other than when I would arrive or leave or when the janitor cleaned the lobby. When I was working behind the desk one night, I would guess that it was around one o'clock in the morning or so. As I sat behind the counter, I occasionally would look around. My view was mainly of the front door and window next to it. Outside of that was a parking lot, which was empty. Behind the parking lot was a fence. I was just casually looking around when all of a sudden I saw this guy walk to the door. He looked right inside and faced me. It was really strange to see because nobody had ever come to the door before. But I then realized that this man who was standing at the door was smiling the creepiest smile I had ever seen. His eyes were so wide, like they were about to pop out of the sockets. It was very unsettling. He had to be joking or something. The man did not try to enter the building though. He just stood there at the door and kept staring at me. I wasn't sure what to do, so I waved at him. He did not wave back to me. He then moved out of sight and I couldn't see him anymore. I was really confused by what had just happened. I had no idea where the guy had come from or what exactly he was doing. I tried to brush it off and figured the outside security guard would soon see the guy, so I called him to let him know, but he hadn't seen the guy at all. I got up and walked over to the door, but the guy was now out of sight. I went back to my desk and was there for the next 30 minutes or so. Then the guy was back. I just looked up and there he was, standing at the door and staring at me again with the same creepy smile. This time I got up, but as soon as I stood up he moved out of sight. I walked over to the door and opened it up. The man was now gone. He must have run off somewhere. I walked around outside until I found the other security guard. I told him about what had happened and we talked for a while. Neither of us knew where the guy had gone. We looked all around the property after that, but he must have left. Then I went back inside. The property was large enough that he could have easily evaded us. And don't ask me why, but there were hardly any security cameras outside. There were a bunch inside but only like two outside that didn't even cover that much space. For the rest of the night, I didn't see him. In fact, I never saw him again. I still wonder who he was and what he was doing. I used to work in a small convenience store in the city. It wasn't quite downtown, but was pretty close. There would be lots of people walking down the sidewalk during the day, and at night there would still be a decent amount of people out, especially after the bars closed nearby. So our store was open 24 hours. It was pretty small, but loaded with all kinds of snacks and drinks and things like that. There were probably five aisles, and then I would be behind the counter at the far end of the store near the doors. I worked at the shop for several months and usually worked overnights. Sometimes it would be pretty busy, and other times it would be really quiet. You never really knew, and it depended on a lot of things. But between the hours of 3 a.m. and 5 a.m., they were generally the quietest. 
so sometime I was working, and I was by myself on a typical night. It was a little bit after 3 a.m., and the store was empty. Occasionally, I would look out the window to the street, and it seemed dead quiet. I was just sitting there behind the counter, going on my phone, and pretty soon, I heard the door open and saw a woman walking in. She entered the store and walked down one of the first aisles. Several minutes went by, and she seemed to just be shopping around like normal. Eventually, when she came up to the counter, she put several items down. When I was starting to scan them, she told me that she only had three dollars and asked me if I could give her a deal. I don't remember exactly what she was buying, but I remember that it added up to like fifteen dollars total. I told her that I couldn't do that. Obviously, she would have to put some things back. I said she would only be able to get things that added up to three dollars. It seemed like common math to me. The woman got angry though and said that she wasn't going to pay for anything. I told her to leave then and she stormed out of the store in anger. Every now and then, customers would be rude or try to get free stuff. I mean, being in a city in the middle of the night, all kinds of people would come in. I was somewhat used to less than ideal customers and thought that I knew how to deal with them. Probably 20 or 30 minutes went by. No more customers came in during that time. Then the door opened and I saw the woman come back, but behind her was a man. This guy was like six foot five, had long stringy hair and a goatee. I'm assuming he was the woman's husband or boyfriend. He walked right up to me looking all angry and then accused me of being rude to the woman. I don't remember what her name was, but the guy started cursing me out and didn't really give me any chance to talk. I could smell the alcohol in his breath as he verbally ripped into me. The woman was just standing back a few feet and adding in a few words of insults here and there to me. I remember that after them yelling at me for like a minute straight, the man wanted to, quote, take it outside with me. I told them both to get out of my store before I called the cops. That's when the guy suddenly shoved me backwards from over the counter. I wasn't ready for it, and to be honest, he was a strong dude. I fell back and it knocked me over. When I got up, I saw the man was right up at the counter wanting to fight me. I moved over to the right, and we had an alarm back there, which I pulled. It was a very loud alarm, and the sound filled the entire store. It was also super annoying, and the guy then backed away from the counter and grabbed some random things off the shelf and threw them. He then knocked over a stand of drinks I went into an aisle and grabbed some more things off the shelves. He stuffed them in his pockets, and the woman at the same time grabbed some stuff with him. Then they both left, stealing a bunch of random things. I called the police and they got there several minutes later. The man and woman were long gone though. The only thing I could do was give a description in my account of what happened. Luckily, neither of them came back while I was working again. A few years back, I worked at a hotel. When I started, I was working at the front desk during overnight hours. The hotel was pretty average size, maybe a little bit large. We don't have any restaurants or bars connected or anything like that, but have lots of rooms. I would sit behind the front desk, and most of the time overnights, nothing happened. Here and there, people would come or go, but most people didn't need to talk to me. This made my job really easy, and I didn't mind being up all night. The event that I'm going to tell you about occurred at just after 2 o'clock in the morning one night. I was working behind the front desk, and I faced the lobby and elevators. To my left, there was a lounge area and a hallway that led to rooms on the first floor. Everything was very quiet until a man entered the hotel. He walked inside and went right past me. I assumed that he was staying at the hotel and was just returning to his room. The guy was pretty average height, light brown hair mid-thirties. He walked down the hallway and was gone. About five minutes later though, he walked by again, this time going to the other hallway. I still didn't think anything of it, but I soon saw him another time. He was once again walking past from one hallway to another. It was sort of behind me, but still in plain sight. It seemed a little bit odd, but there was nothing wrong with it. But several minutes later, I went to go get some water. There was a dispenser in the lounge and you had to walk past the hallway to get there. As I was passing by, I noticed somebody in the hallway a ways down. I looked and noticed that it was the same guy. 
He was standing outside of a door, and it appeared as though he couldn't get inside, but was trying to. I thought maybe he was locked out of his room, or possibly he was trying to get into somebody else's. I started to walk over to him and was going to ask him if he needed help with something. When I got a few steps closer to him, he stopped and looked at me. Before I could say anything, the guy turned and then walked away in the other direction. Then he disappeared around a corner. It was really suspicious. I started to figure that the guy probably didn't even have a room here. I went back to my front desk and decided to look at the security monitors. We had cameras in every single hallway. Unfortunately, the video quality was honestly quite bad. Many details were hard to make out. I looked around until I spotted the guy on one of the cameras. He walked past it down a hallway. Then he went to a door and appeared to try to open it. It looked like possibly he was knocking on the door then or something. He was standing at it for a while. Then he paced around a little before returning to the door. This was too suspicious and I decided to go ask him what was going on. I got up and walked over to where the guy was. The hallways could get a little bit complicated on the first floor. The second and third floor was very simple, but the first floor had more hallways. I walked to the one that the man was at. When I reached the beginning of the hallway, I saw him. He was a ways down, probably almost a hundred feet. Almost as soon as I was within sight of him, he looked over to me. I asked him what he was doing. The guy just started sprinting towards me then. He appeared to be running as fast as he possibly could. This wasn't what I was expecting, and I moved back and started heading towards the front. The guy was still running and quickly approaching me. By the time I got back to the lobby, he was a lot closer. I could hear him running. I decided to run out of the hotel and see if the man would. After I made it outside, I realized that he did in fact follow me out, and he was also a lot closer than I expected, now only about 40 feet away probably. I didn't think that I would be able to get to my car on time if he was chasing me, so I ran across the street. Across the street and a little ways down was a 24 hour gas station. So I ran all the way there and when I got there, I went inside. The guy hadn't crossed the street and stayed in the hotel parking lot. I think he went back in the hotel after that, but I called the police. I reported a suspicious man trying to enter hotel rooms and chasing me when I confronted him. The police were very quick to respond and got there only like a minute later. They entered the hotel which the man was still inside of. He tried running away, but was caught and removed from the hotel. He wouldn't say what he was doing there or why he was trying to get inside of rooms. After that, I talked with police for a while and then returned to work. I was really creeped out by the whole situation, but grateful to be all right. That was an experience that made me want to stop working overnights, and I did shortly after. Last night, my boyfriend and I were driving home from Universal Studios in Orlando. We were rerouted away home we've never went before and were traveling in basically the middle of nowhere. My boyfriend's speedometer is broken on his car and he has to press the button to reset the miles after he gets gas. This will be very important soon. We were driving on a deserted road in the middle of absolute nowhere without a single car in sight. My boyfriend realized we hit the 130 mile mark on his odometer. We needed gas but there was literally not one gas station in sight. I put search gas stations nearby and we found one. It turned out to be closed. In a hurry, we found another gas station five minutes up the road. This is where the story gets weird. My boyfriend thought he closed his gas cap and were once again driving along this deserted road. We heard a loud bang and he realized he forgot to put the gas cap back on. So we're driving around this dark road looking for the gas cap. He finally pulls over and realizes somehow the gas cap is still attached to the car. We get back on track to the other gas station. Out of nowhere, I had a horrible thought about something going wrong at that gas station. I pushed it aside because I knew we needed gas and AAA is not an option where we were at the moment. We get to this gas station and the lights are kind of on. This road literally leads to a dead end with a gas station on it. The only way to leave this area was to turn left or go straight out of the gas station. My boyfriend got out of the car to see if we could get gas and the feeling intensified. I have literally never felt like that in my life. My stomach dropped into my butt. 
I have been in very disturbing situations such as almost being kidnapped twice, being followed home, watching someone be taken away in a body bag after being hit by a car, and even a paranormal situation, but I have never felt like this before. I saw a white car pulling up to the road to make a left. Keep in mind there is literally no one on this road. He pulls up and notices my boyfriend and backs up with his windows down. I found this very strange because my boyfriend has a very nice sports car, and my mind immediately went into panic mode. I started screaming his name, and the man realized that someone else was in the car, turned left and sped off. Sadly, I didn't get his license plate because of how dark it was. This situation frightened me more than you can even imagine. It may not seem too scary, but it was easily one of the most terrifying things to watch, because I didn't know if I was going to witness my boyfriend being robbed at gunpoint or something like that. The feeling and thought I had just 10 minutes earlier is what also made the situation even worse. We found a gas station with actual human life around, and we made it home safe and sound. Once I got home, my dad told me that the road we were driving on was famous for the many bodies being found on it. I hope no one ever gets put into this situation. And to the man who was planning to do something to my boyfriend, let's never meet.